Good afternoon, fret friends. Now, I know I say this a lot, but I say it a lot because it's true. And we have something really quite special in today. And uh, I've definitely not had one of these in the workshop ever. It's a Gibson Les Paul Deluxe, I believe, with P90s. And it's dated 1972. If that is true, that makes this the oldest Les Paul I've had in the workshop for a refret. And I just did a 1973 Deluxe, not too long ago, which had a warped and bent neck, which I straightened, then I refretted. And it was a big, big project. It was an expensive project for the owner, but it did add 2,000 pounds value to the guitar. Now this again, value-wise, I don't know, I expect it to be in the thousands of pounds. Definitely in the thousands. Anything from three to 5,000 quid? Surely quite easily and this again is in for a refret and the frets on this is nothing on them it's almost like a fretless wonder it might have been a fretless wonder I don't know but really really flat frets so we're going to remove the frets and we're going to refret we're going to remove the nibs as well and we're going to bring the new frets over the edge of the binding right up to the edge so a lot of work there's also had a nut replaced there's a shim under the nut on this one there's a bit of damage around the nut area I'm going to replace the nut for a bone nut uh, because we're going to be using a higher fret wire anyway, so we do have to replace that. So I have to be extra careful removing the nut from my guitar. I will show you, I'll bring the guitar up to the camera. Just saying, you see underneath there's a shim underneath, looks like a piece of plastic. Be very careful getting that off. Um, I will be straightening and re radiusing the neck as well. So with this, we're removing the hardware, the hardware, I'll sink the pickups right inside the guitar, remove the uh, pick guard there. Now, I do believe all the electrics and everything have been replaced in the past. Otherwise, why would these things be here? So these are likely to be the Switchcraft Originals. And these, I would imagine, are the original pots in there. So let's just have a look. You normally get a date on them. You can date these by looking at the serial and there's certain numbers on there that will give us the date. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what numbers they are on here, but it's something I may look up a little bit later on. But they certainly look like they were the original pots on there. I will have a look inside, however. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to plug it in and play it. I know it's going to not play bloody because of the fresh, but I'm going to make sure the electrics are all working fine, that the pickups are working fine. Once that's done, I'm going to take the strings off, I'm going to remove all the hardware I need to remove, I'm going to protect the areas that need protecting on the guitar, I'm going to have a look at the electrics, and uh, I'm going to prep this ready for removing the frets. Now, there's no time scale on this one, I do it at my leisure. I will take my time with this. Um, it is a set price for a job of this ilk. Uh, we are looking in the region of all said and done. You're probably looking in the region of 325, 350 pounds when all said and done. May come in under that, but we are replacing the nut as well. Replacing the nut, carving a new nut from a bone blank and fitting that as well is going to be in the region of 65 pounds anyway. You refresh 200 quid plus the wood and the chip repair. Uh, you've got uh, uh, some extra on top. You've got your hardware, you've got your fret wire to buy, your strings your new nut, blah, blah, blah. So I would say we're looking 325 pounds-ish, somewhere around there. Uh, it depends how much work we need to do on the neck. If we need to straighten it, there's gonna be an uh, additional on top. I think we've got a budget around about 350 pounds. We're certainly gonna get in under that. So let me do those things I said I'm gonna do, and um, I'll get back to you later. Just before I do do that, I'm just gonna see if I can see there is a serial number there, but it's so faint, I'm going to, it looks like 581940, but I'm not sure. It's not a stamp one, it's an ink one, and it's under the paint. So I'm going to try and get a blown up picture of that, and I'll try and find out. I'm also going to talk to the owner. Um, something else about the guitar, the state of it, it's got a few dings and knocks somewhere in certain places, scratches on the back, which means it's been played, which is fantastic. It's 1972. It means it's a 49 year old guitar. It's nearly as old as me. It's got a great weight to it as well. I love a good heavy guitar. I know that owner loves this. He bought it from a guy in a band called, a 70s band, I believe, called Hunter. I don't think they did anything 
just about checking. I don't know, I looked on Wikipedia, I can't think, uh, not Wikipedia, on Google, I can't find anything about it, but that was a logo. This is the original case. The case is a little bit battered, a little bit worse for wear, but it does protect the guitar. But anyway, we'll do what I said and uh, back soon. So, okay, I've been inside the guitar. Um, we do have new pots and new capacitors in there. Looks like some bumblebee type capacitors, but not one, we've just got a black casing. Um, definitely new pots in there and a new switch in the back there. And it's not turned the right way, but ah, that's because it's loose, that's why. Uh, maybe it's turned that way because the wire in there is not quite long enough, I don't know. But we're not bothered about that. I'm going to um, loosen everything in a short while anyway. So I just wanted to show you that before I move on. So back again soon. So doing the simple things first. I've just removed the nut. The nut came off really, really easily. All I did was put my hand behind it and just tapped it with the notch straight edge. It came straight off. I've removed the shim from underneath, which is a piece of, uh, I don't know what it was, a piece of plastic from something. Maybe a bit of a credit card type affair or something like that. I don't know. Now there's quite some uh, there's some areas of slight damage on this guitar, so I'm going to show all these as much as I can, just to cover myself. Um, this area, for instance, uh, just below my finger, there was all damage, all the lacquer come off there, and blah 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 blah. I'm going to be cleaning up this area, sanding back those two blobs of glue went here as well, there and there. Just to smooth that off. Um, all the bits go in a pot. I always have a pot when I'm working on a guitar. All the bits are going in there. I might as well just, they're not coming out anyway, so I can leave these bits in, I think. Just leave the screw those down out of the way. Uh, the pickups I'm going to try and screw into the body of the guitar. Let's just see where, see where our position is. That's pretty good. So certain things, I'm going to remove the, the three-way selector, I'm going to drop it inside the guitar, uh, just so it's out of the way for when we're filing these frets later on, but I don't want anything there right now anyway, so let's just uh, loosen that and get that out of the way. I'm going to remove the tip as well, if it comes off, it's not, it's not glued, that's good. Again, in the pot in the pot. There are dings and nicks on the guitar here, there, here and there. I'm sure we have those about. The reason we're dropping this in there is when I'm working on this area, this will all be taped up and covered up. I remove the uh, pit guard, scratch plate type. There. Drop the pickles up as low as we can get them. And this is prepping everything. We're getting the frets out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, I want to have a look at the neck, see how straight it is or isn't, because I would ideally like this neck dead straight before we fret it. I'm going to loosen the truss rod and see what condition the neck is in, see how straight it is or isn't. We may have to try and bend it, clamp it back one way or the other, just to get it dead straight. It should, all right, be straight with the truss rod slackened. So let's just loosen it off and see where we are. Okay, that seems to be loose. I may remove this knot and we'll get some more lube on there, it's never gonna hurt. So let me just see the state of the neck with the truss rod loose. And that looks pretty, to be pretty much straight to me. Okay, it's not straight at all. There is quite a lot of relief in there with the rod loose. The neck should be dead straight, but it is a 49 year old guitar. So over the years, with the truss rod tightened up, it's obviously had an effect on the wood, which it should do. See how much it takes. Right, that is just now coming to tension right there. We're just coming to tension, so I'm going to give it, let's give it a, oh, there you go, it's just coming to tension there. So let's give it a quarter turn. That's a one quarter turn. If we've got the next rate on a quarter turn, I will be really, really happy with that. 
No, it's not straight. Okay, let's do it again. Give it about there, so a quarter and an eighth. So three eighths. And it's still not straight. So we're going to have to bend this neck somehow. Give it another turn. So that's a half turn on the truss rod. And we're now of the neck almost straight. I'm going to back clamp this neck ever so slightly overnight or over a period of a day or two, maybe. So that's something I've not considered. So it's something I'm going to do. I'm not going to do it today because I'm going to have to uh, change things around in the workshop. I'm going to have to clear one of the benches. Now I'm going to London this week. I can work tomorrow, but I can't work Tuesday. I'm getting tattooed on Tuesday. It's Sunday today. So this may just go on hold for a short while until I get back and I'll go on and move on to something else. Because I do have other things to do. I don't know why that piece of plastic's in there between the pickup. I'll check that out a bit. Anyway, so what I'm thinking of doing is putting this one on hold a short one, a short time. Bear with me, I need to get these pickups out of the way. I can't get them out of the way because they seem to be in as far as much as, as much as they'll go. That doesn't do anything. Those pickups are fixed. Which means are they going to be in the way when I work? No, they are far enough out of the way for me not to have to worry about them, but only just. Okay, that's fine. Again, hurdles or obstacles to overcome. That's fine where we are. So what I can do in the meantime is I think I'm going to get this on the jig today. No, I can't because I'm not going to bend it on the jig. It may be a better idea to bend this with the frets out. Let me ponder what I'm going to do and I will come back and let you know. Good morning fret friends. We have the 1972 Gibson Les Paul Deluxe clamped up and clamped here and here. The guitar fully supported, fully padded. Uh, once we've got it clamped and steady, or a metal rod or a metal bar across the neck and we're back clamping the neck. That's because the bend in the neck is that way. We've got extra relief in there. Let me just zoom in. So you can see, I think that's pretty good. So we've got relief in the neck. So we're bending it backwards with the steel strip. We're placing a clothes iron on there. Now the clothes iron is on cool warm. It's on number one. I can more or less, I can skim my hand straight across it. And we're just very gently getting heat in there. Now I've already got heat all the way through the length of the neck, just about. I've had it on here for about an hour and a half so far. And we just turn it around and again. And we're just gently coaxing that relief out of the neck by bending it, in fact, over bending it slightly backwards. Once I release the tension on that, it's probably going to go back to straight. I'm still thinking it's going to have a little bit of relief in there, but certainly less than it had when I removed the truss rod not, uh, adjuster. The truss rod adjuster is off. There's no tension on the truss rod at all, which is exactly how I want it. And we're going to try and coat this back to as straight as possible. It'll just make it easier in the long run uh, for setting the neck once we've got the new frets in. So it's something that does happen over the years. This is a 49 year old guitar and 49 years of strings pulling this way and my truss rod pushing that way has taken its toll and my neck has slightly bent. Uh, as, as another one I've got in, it's only a 14, 15 year old guitar. It's done pretty much the same thing, but not as bad as this. So we always try and get the neck as straight as possible. Now, once we remove the frets and got the new ones in, if we've still got, there we go, I'm going the opposite way. If we've still got relief in there, what we're going to do is, I'm going to stick it on the neck jig. Now this is the copy of a Stumac neck jig I built a couple of years ago. Uh, it's made, but it's, well I made it. It's from a design by a guy called, is his name Vanson or Vincent or something? And it's, all we're going to do is we're going to clamp the body here. Once it's clamped in we can use these steel rods to set the neck dead straight uh, by means of a, well, a pulley system here. Which we can pull the neck down and we can set it dead straight and support with these steel bars and relief. Once it's dead straight we can level the new frets 
that are in there, but we could do it properly with a set straight neck. So all this is going to do is we're going to replicate a perfectly straight neck later on. We may not need this. I think we are going to need it. Um, it's why it's out. But once this one's done, I'm going to leave about another 30 minutes or so. Once that's done, I'm going to remove the clamps, have a look, see where the neck is. I've got another one, another guitar to do exactly the same as I'm doing with this one. This is a 1972 Gibson Les Paul. I also have a 2004 Gibson Les Paul with the same problem. It's in for a refret. It has a slight bit of relief in there with the truss rod not off. So we're going to get them as straight as possible. Once they're straight, we can work on them much easier and it's going to be better in the long run. Ideally, when you remove a truss rod nut or loosen a truss rod nut, your neck should be straight. In this case, it's in both, in both of these cases, it's not. But then again, it does happen over time. So this is all standard. I've got the iron on pretty cool because I don't want to be melting anything. I mean, you can melt the glue, you can uh, scorch the inlays. I've actually scorched inlays before. So I now know to use a cooler iron. Um, so I'm pretty confident this is going to work pretty well. If this is just warm to touch. It's not hot, it's warm. And that's exactly what we want. So this is my method of straightening the neck with cool heat. And now I'll just explain where we are. We have one clamp on the body here. We have the body supported underneath with plenty of padding and clamped right on above the heel. Uh, once that's clamped and that's clamped, that's set. The neck will freely just uh, just freely be there with nothing, no clamps, I don't need anything underneath to bend it. And all I'm doing is using this clamp just to tighten down, just to take that little bit of relief out of it. So we're clamping that way. It's a system I've used for many years. It's a system that is very successful. Uh, it works. It doesn't work 100% all of the time, but it certainly gets your neck quite a lot straighter. So uh, we'll let this do its work, do its thing, and uh, we'll have a look again in a few minutes. So I've just removed the clamps. Uh, obviously taking the iron away and we have the neck more or less straight there's some slight scorching on the uh, inlays but we're not worried about that it's very very slight it's going to add to the look of this guitar anyway but yeah that neck is just about dead straight so really really pleased with how that's come out what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to stick the clamp back on there just so it doesn't uh, Try and curl back. Is that going to fit there? I don't think that's going to fit there, is it? Let's try this way. Give me a second, I'm sure I've done this properly before. I'm going to nip that and just hold it there, just so it just holds in place. It's not any great stress on that. Now, when I do the other guitar later, which is blue, I'm going to use a cooler iron because this is just slight, ever so slightly scorched the top of the inlays. Now, once I sand that back anyway, it's going to remove all that scorching off there. So it's nothing major. It's just something you got to watch out for. It's because these frets are so low on here. They're less than half a millimetre high. In my the iron on a really low heat, it's still slightly scorched. I'm not worried about it at all. It's very minor and it's something we can uh, eradicate anyway. But yeah, really, really happy with how the neck has come out. I'm going to let it cool down now with that clamp in place. Once it's cooled down, remove a clamp and the neck will be good to work. Okay guys, so for the sake of three hours of clamping with gentle heat, we have the neck straight. And that just gives us a great canvas or a blank canvas to work from. And I don't expect it to be perfectly straight, but let's just have a look. And that is more or less perfectly straight. That is just fantastic news. So you'll see the guitar at the moment on the um, so my neck jig or guitar jig. I mean, I'm, I'm not strapped it in yet, but I've got the jig all set up. I don't actually need the jig right now. I'm going to be removing the fret shortly. But for sake of argument, I may as well get it lined up and ready to go on the jig. Now, for those of you who have not seen this jig before, go on Google and look up Stumac Early Wine guitar jig and you'll see a piece of equipment that is for strapping a guitar in and setting the neck down straight it costs you about to get one imported to England 
uh, with import tax and shipping over it probably cost you about 800 pounds i built this for about 100 pounds and it does exactly the same thing it's virtually identical to the original stumac version it's a great piece of kit and it enables me to strap the guitar in and support the neck underneath get the neck dead straight and support it by means of these steel bars underneath i'll try and get the camera move later on so you can get a better view of this but yeah what a great great piece of kit so I just need to tighten this up just a little to even that out and that's it so this is going to enable me to get the neck precision straight um, for when I level the new frets later now I'm not, I don't have to use this now I'm not going to use it now I'm going to actually remove this from the jig in set, on second thoughts I'm going to get the frets out and we're going to Tell a lie, I'm going to leave it on the jig because I'm going to re radius the fingerboard. So we're going to have a look at getting the frets out now. I'm not going to treat them to any heat right here, right now. I'm going to pull out my fret removal tools. Again, this workshop does need a little bit of work. It needs to be rearranged. I've got stumac boxes here with tools in that are not being sorted properly. It's why I've been taking some time out from the workshop. I need to rearrange everything and redo this workshop. Well, let's see what we've got in here. And there you go, we don't have my fretting tools. Now I do have a fret removal plier there. Works really flush. I'm just going to pull one out of that, treating it to any heat if I can get one. And now I'm going to really, really struggle getting these frets out because they're so low. There's nothing for this. Hold on, let's just see there if we can. No, really, really. There you go. I've got I just managed to pull that. So these are going to be quite difficult to get out. And I want to get them out without chipping the fingerboard, which I have done with that one. But look at this. Wow, there's nothing on this fret at all, there is no height there at all. We're about a third of a millimetre, not even that. Quarter of a millimetre height on these frets. There's nothing on that, but it has come out cleanly. There's no chip there. Let's just see how we're gonna get on. Really, really difficult to get, a, get any purchase on there, but that one, I've got that one again. I'm gonna to have to take my time with this. I do have a better plier, because it's gonna to wanna to chip, yeah, it's really wanting to chip. So I'm gonna use heat to get these out. I can see this wanting to chip the fingerboard, and I don't wanna be chipping the fingerboard because it takes a long time to repair. So I'm gonna do this the proper way. I'm gonna get the jig, I don't need the jig. The jig is now set up though for the purpose I need it for, or for what I need it for later on. So I'm going to basically put the jig away. I'm going to come back, set this bench up, and we're going to come back, we're going to take these frets out properly. So bear with me, back shortly. I've resorted to the correct method of removing frets, especially really low ones like this, and we're heating them with a soldering iron, just to soften the glue. It, the hardest thing about removing frets this flat this low is it's really really difficult to get a grip on them so I've got my soldering iron set at 370 Celsius I'm just going to heat the fret to get it like I say the hardest thing is getting it started just heat the fret just to soften any glue in there get I'm using my guitars and wood fret puller really nice and smooth it gets right under there and I've got a chip stopper there it's a tool, Stumac sell these. And these frets don't really want to come out easily. This chip stopper though will help stop chips. And it's going to take me a bit longer to get the frets out. But we're not chipping. Uh, this is going to need some work with fingerboard. Well, that's a chip stopper. You slide that under, under the fret as you're starting to get the fret out. And again, it's a matter of being patient. Just got to be patient with this. These frets have been in for 49 years. So say the guitar was built, if it's a 1972 guitar, say it was built in 1971, possibly construction 1970, it's a 50 year old guitar. 
these frets have been in 50 years. Not going to be easy to get out. And I'm trying to minimise the chipping as much as possible, which means I spend less time repairing chips. And it's important that we do repair the chipped areas. And we clean out the slots. I have a special saw for cleaning out the slots, by the way. Now the binding on this, there's nothing to it. It is so thin. It's less than half a millimetre thick. So I need to keep this intact. I don't want to saw through it. I don't have a special saw that saws inside the slots. Again, a lot of this work is really time consuming. It's why you're going to be charging, or I'm going to be charging around about £350 for this whole job. But it's a small price to pay for a three to five thousand pound guitar getting it refretted. So we've got some heat in there. The hardest part is getting a start. I've got that one started straight away. Look at that. That's really good. That's because I've got some heat in there. So again. You've got to be patient with this. You don't want it chipping. Well, we're not coming out quickly. That's okay. Take us time. Because this will save us time in the long run. I've done enough of these jobs now to know that it really pays take your time we do have a little chip in that one there but anyway painstaking job it's going to take a long time bear with me i'm just going to I'm going to show you some little bits of all the work if i could find so here you go here's the saw. Uh, just so it saves time for later so getting to the slots it's a little, little hosco saw but cuts in two directions and that's what we're going to be using to clear the slots but we don't want to be cutting through the binding so we take us time and there you go this wood is really dry it might actually pay me to soak this fingerboard in some mineral oil you know it's lemon oil before these slots don't need much cleaning at all they are quite clean and they certainly are deep enough have a chip just there. So I'm going to get some super glue on hand with a very tiny tip on there. Bear with me, I'll be doing all this. This is all being done live. You're with me on this journey. It's only a difficult job if you don't do it right. We always try you should always do the job right. So let me just grab some CA, you know it's CA glue for you Americans. Super glue. I don't know what's super about it. I think it's horrible stuff. But anyway, we're going to stick a little nozzle on there. And where this chip is trying to fall out here, I'm not going to zoom in, I'm just going to put a little blob of glue, CA glue, tiny amount there. And I'm just going to wick it in. And that will find a level under that chip that came out. The chip is back in. I need to just go and grab some tissue paper. Bear with me. Again, this is giving you an insight to um, the amount of work that goes into a job like this. The refretting is not a straightforward job. It's not a matter of just taking frets out and putting new frets in, far from it. But there you go, there's that one. And that's that chip replaced. Got another one, no I haven't, that's just a piece of tissue. So we have a chip there to repair later. But yeah guys, seriously, take your time. It's a it's a vintage guitar. It's an irreplaceable piece of kit. Do it right. 
So let's go again. And it may be, you'll get some of these come out really easily. But there's nothing on these frets. Now, as mentioned before, I am going to re-radius this board. It should be a 12 inch radius. I'll get a radius beam, stick some 240 grit sandpaper on it, and we're going to re-radius the whole board. Because you'll find it is not, no, it's no longer a 12 inch radius. It will have changed over the years with wear. So you see how time consuming this is. If I charged by the hour, the refret costs you 600 quid. Easily. So you see, just gently heat, take your time. I'm hoping you can see there chip stopper oh we've got a big big chip out of there where's that one gone Let's take a right big chip out of there I don't even know where the woods are it doesn't matter we are going to replace it we're going to fill it no idea where that piece of wood's gone just zoom in a little I don't think you're going to see it from where you are but Nice big chunk come out there. I don't know what I could have done to avoid that. We will be, oh, is this it here? I think I found it, that's great. If we can find it and put it back in, even better. Yeah, there it is, and that's a good one. Can you see it on my finger there? That's a very good chip. I'm going the right way around. We're going to wick some super glue in under that. Always better to replace it if you, if you can. And there you go, you'd never know there. So again, you're going to get this. The wood's really brittle. It's been on there many, many years. Wicked in like so. I maybe should get some blotting paper for this, shouldn't I? But there you go, and that's not only repaired, that's replaced and put back in. You'd never know that had come out. So yeah, take your time. Even though I took my time in, I was really careful. I st still got a big chip out of the fingerboard there. So you can be as careful as you like. It's going to chip, trust me, it's going to chip. I think people who do our job are highly skilled. Those who do it correctly, do it right. I know loads of great guitar techs, luthiers, what have you. I don't call myself a luthier. I've never built a string instrument. I'm a guitar tech with luthier skills, I imagine. I will build one day, and I'm sure I'll be brilliant at it. And I'm not just bragging. That was now my skill level. But yeah, the repair game Probably more difficult than that. Not, I'm not knocking the building game or Luthery, Luthery at all. It's just the repair game is probably a little bit more difficult because you're repairing things that are broken, whereas if you're building, you're building from scratch. You know, you're not repairing old mistakes or something that's been around for years and years and years. Not to take anything away from the builders at all. 
Oh wow, what a skill. I've even had Luthiers to tell me that, saying what you do is actually more difficult than what I do. If you get enough heat in, by the way, it's not going to chip because the glue around the fret is softened. I didn't use a chip stopper there and I've got nothing like the chip on there. That is the one that's come out of the class quite cleaner than any other. It's beautiful. Video is going to be a long one, by the way. I do like to leave the camera running while I work. Um, I do find silence a bit awkward. I don't work in silence. I normally have something on on my iPad, some music or something maybe I want to listen to. I do find uh, Brian Wampler's videos or Josh from JHS. I think their videos are brilliant. I like to stick them on in the background sometimes, but I find myself wanting to come and see what they're doing so normally I'd stick something on if it's not gospel related I'll stick some old Sh Sherlock Holmes movie on you know Basil Rathbone and stick that on in the background because you can more or less follow them without watching in those old movies it's like they're almost patronising the way they thought people were stupid so they'd explain everything anyway even though you can see what's happening so you can, you can kind of watch them without watching if you know what I mean so very, really, in fact, not even really, I don't work in silence. Who'd want to? Okay, just nipping across here. Because I'm getting enough heat in there, it's not wanting to chip at all. Put my finger on there just to keep it stable. Again, and that's came, come out beautifully. So we've got our seven frets are out. It's going to take me a while, this. So I'm actually going to do, like I just said, I'm going to put my iPad on, put something on. The reason I'm not filming it with something on is I've been, I've been done for copyright before. I had some music on in the background, and if just take it off or remove a video. Talk about annoying. Got a bit of puff of something there. I think I'll just hit the uh, inlay there with that. It's no problem. We're not going to be sanding over there anyway. Great pair of uh, fret pullers, these, this pair I've got at the end. I don't buy from guitar woods anymore. I had some really dodgy stuff from there a while back and I fell out with them big time. But yeah, great piece of kit this. So that's it guys. I'm going to carry on getting these frets out. I have some repairs to do. One there, two there, one there. So I have four repairs to do so far. It'd be fantastic if I could keep this under 20. It'd be really, really good. Normally I have about 40, 50, 60 repairs to do on an old neck, but this one is going really, really well so far, uh, considering that we have really difficult frets and they're really low. So, back soon with an update. Don't be under any illusions that we always like to pretty things up here at Fret Friend. And we like to make everything look as if everything's running smoothly because things don't always run smoothly. But you see here, I've got a block taped onto the body of the guitar and that is not a block of anything. It's the pickle I've had to remove from its slots because if a pickle was left in it, it doesn't go low enough for me to re the fingerboard. So I've had to take it out, to tape it to the top of the body because the wires are so short and just get it out of the way because I'm going to go in across here with a radius beam and I would have been hitting the pickle otherwise, so I've had to get it out of the way. It just gives me enough room to get a radius beam in there, 12 inch radius beam, for me, to, for me to be able to re-radius the fingerboard. Now, I've not strapped, I've strapped the guitar in, but I've not set the neck straight yet. I'm gonna do that in a minute. I'm gonna move the camera so you can see exactly what I'm doing and how this piece of kit works. 
because it is a fabulous, fabulous piece of kit, this neck jig. It's something I made myself a few years ago, and it does the job, makes the job a lot easier. What we're going to have to do is, because the neck is not perfectly straight, we're going to force it straight by use of these rod, steel rods underneath and support and a clamp and we're going to pull it down to make sure we get that little bit of relief out of the neck. Once it's all clamped, supported and clamped down, we'll get this neck absolutely straight or as straight as we possibly can. And then we're going to re-radius the fingerboard, thus giving us a straight playing surface uh, and giving us a straight surface for the new frets. Uh, so it's unfortunate we have to actually force it into straightness rather than it is actually straight. End of the day, it's 50 years old this neck. It's been clamped, it's been, the strings have been pulling that way for 50 years and the truss rod's been bending it that way for 50 years. So there always is a bit of a trade-off and it's always the neck that gives and it always tends to give this way. So we have bent it back, we've got it as straight as we possibly can using minimal heat. It is close to being straight, it's absolutely fine to work with. Um, it's just we have to use a little bit of, not so much trickery, but we have to use certain methods to make sure that we are playing with a level or straight neck. If we can't get it perfectly straight, we've got to force it into straightness to be able to work on it properly. So, it's all good. I just wanted to show you that and explain about the pickup. We've got to be very careful not to hit this or to snap a wire or anything. We won't do. It's just I'm going to have to be working over. Let me just get a radius. Uh, being out while I'm explaining things, uh, give you more of an idea. Now this workshop needs another rearrange because there's tools that are now, certain tools that are now retired and I need to get them gone and out of the way. So I've bought that many new fretting tools and jigs last year or so, bear with me a second, I'm trying to find the 12 inch I mean, it's not there, that means it's out. Of course it's out. Nine and a half. You know what it is, it's the furthest one away. Of course it is. Oh, here we go, what we got here? Size is this one, that's a nine and a half. Bear with me, guys. Totally unprepared, as per usual. What have I done with my 12 inch radius beam? That's fantastic, I can't find it right now. Okay, bear with me, I'll stop the video and I will come back. And 15 seconds later, I'm back with it. It was in the first box I looked in, all in its cellophane. Now it already has some paper on there. That'll be 240 grit sandpaper. And that is my 12 inch radius beam. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna be re-radiusing the board, but not until we've got it straight. So I'll be taking a precision straight edge, which I have here, by Veritas. There it is. Great piece of kit. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna stick it on the fingerboard like so. And see how straight this neck is. I made a good job of that. That is very, very close to being perfectly straight. There is a gap, a slight bit of relief in there, but it is not much at all. So what I'm going to do is, you can't see where you are. Just tell my wife, I'm going to move the camera shortly. I'm just going to put this strap on there. And I'm going to set this neck, get the neck straight, I'm going to get it all clamped back and you'll see exactly what I mean short and once I've got this set up I just need to bring that in there like so get that off there you yeah, guys take my word for everything right now I could have done this the other way around but you know this will work this will still work let me go that side so what I'm going to do with this is I'm just going to pull it down I'm going to get the neck straight It just means pulling down on the headstock area by means of this gubbins here. Okay, it doesn't want to go perfectly straight, but that is just about right there. So I'm just going to need to pull that down like so. That is now locked in place. 
Okay, it doesn't want to go perfectly straight. What we're going to do is we are going to make it straight by taking these rods underneath and forcing it straight. As straight as we can get it. That, my friends, is as straight as we're going to get this. There's a tiny, tiny gap of relief. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to move the camera, show you exactly where I am with this, and you're going to get it. Be with me a second. So, okay, so now you're getting an idea of where we are. This is the neck jig here. These are the steel bolts underneath supporting the neck. This is a clamp pulling the neck down that way. And we're trying to force it to straight. There is a tiny bit of relief under straight edge there now we're not going to get rid of i don't think we can get rid of all of that relief but what we're going to do is we are going to ever so slightly tighten this here by use of a wing knot underneath pulling the headstock down while these are supported and it's just going to try and remove as much as that relief in there as we can And that is as straight as I can get it. And I'll tell you what, that really will do. That's fantastic. So you may see a very, very thin line of light under there, but that is so minimal. That's as straight as we're going to get that neck. We've got everything now locked in. And I'm well happy with that. That is very, very close to perfectly straight. So what I can do with this now is take the 12-inch radius block and we can re-radius the fingerboard. Now I cannot do this without getting in the way of the camera, so I'm just going to show, I'm just going to mimic how it works, and that's how it works. I'm going to re-radius the board to 12 inches. I'm sure it is 12 inches. I'll go and check that before I do it. But there you go. That's how I'm going to do it. We're going to get that neck dead straight. And uh, once that's done, we can go and get the new frets in. I'm going to use exactly the same principle for levelling the frets later on. It's going to come back on the jig. And we need the jig just to force the neck straight. It's going to be absolutely fine once it's all strung up and we've got the truss rod to tension. Um, but yeah. So, just about um, getting to where we need to be. A couple of spots just here, a little bit low. Uh, that's nothing to worry about you do expect that over many many years of playing but we are back to a 12 inch radius just going to go over a couple more We've got a little bit of a hump in the middle on the treble side but what i'm looking for straightness down the center straightness up this line just coming inside following my line in a straight line so on the outside of there up to about there so I've got my precision straight edge and we're just going with a straight line I've got the tiniest hump that side just around this area which I'm going to work on in a second That is looking spot on. And this side, a tiny, tiny hump again, round about this 12 fret area. So I can take some more coarse grit paper, I've got 80 grit on here. I'm just going to work on this middle bit here. Again, a 12 inch radius. work just on this middle bit I 
add more to the profile. Just ever so slightly, that's all. And that is looking pretty good. Just keep checking. Tiny, tiny hump in the middle. That's gone from the far side. Again, the tiniest hump just here, just on this bit round here. Let's turn that round. It's hardly enough to make any difference to anything. I mean, once I've got a fraction and level, you're never going to know. It's that minimal. And there you go, we're saying straight there. We're straight there. And we're straight there. We have a straight and radiused neck. Give it a brush off. And bore that little bit of a dip up there, and a little tiny bit there. We have a 12 inch radius along the whole length of the neck. We've already removed any material at all. I'm going to have to clear these slots out. Uh, that one will not be a problem. You can even get it with a brush like this. Some small chipped areas I need to repair. Which I'll do next. That's great. So chips, one there needs repair, two, three, four, five, five, maybe six chips I need to repair. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If I'm being picky, seven, eight, nine, Ten chipped areas for ten chips to fix. That is nothing. I'm normally fixing 50 or 60. Very, very slight scorching to this inlay here. All the other inlays are fine. <coughs> I did work with a cool iron uh, just on number one. Nibs are removed. There was hardly any nib left to be honest. The frets were that low, so you weren't going to notice. Anyway, I am really pleased with how that's come out. So what I'm going to do is just a final few passes with the with this big one. Just to make sure that I'm happy with everything. Should not be brushing the rose dust off and breathing it in. No wonder I had a block sinus for all those years. But anyway. Give it a go. Sorry about that, it's my wife just come in singing. My wife came tootling in from the back garden, not thinking, not a problem. Uh, she's out there painting today. We've got a barbecue happening at the end of the month, another one. We've one for my birthday, end of June. We're having one for her birthday at the end of uh, August. So she's painting the walls out there. Um, regarding the levelling or, or the reprofiling of the neck or re radiusing that is done. Um, we are finished here. I need to repair around about 10 chipped areas. Uh, I'm looking for my brush. What have we done with it? 
There you go. Yeah, a few chips to repair. But while I'm here, I might as well show you. Oh, I clear these slots ready for frets. And a brush is a great idea. Great piece of kit, that. Now, I did have my little saw out earlier. Place gets really, really messy when you're working with uh, wood dust. I'm going to have it all up my nose. But anyway, back to this little saw here. It's specifically made for fret slots. And these aren't going to need hardly any work because they're already deep enough. There's no glue in there and they are clean anyway. It's just a matter of getting in there, making sure. They are clear, really, really easy. It looks really straight through. Not a problem at all. One area of concern for me is that pickle being out. I don't like that pickle being out. You never do. The P90s, you can't adjust them high or low. You're supposed to be able to, I think, adjust them a little bit, but there's no springs underneath. Now, the owner of this guitar says he has ordered the guitar once a year, but this wood, this rosewood here, is really, really dry. I am going to um, give it a coat of mineral oil just to soften these slots up a little bit. It means I've got to scrape the oil out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that while I'm away in London. I'm not going to refret this before I go like I wanted to. I'll go to London on Thursday. Tomorrow I've been tattooed, so I probably won't want to work Wednesday anyway. After getting my sleeve finished. So these slots are pretty much ready for frets. I don't think we're going to take frets that well because the wood is dry, which means it's brittle. I will check the depth of the slots in a moment. I do have a depth of slot gauge. We need to be 1.8 millimeters. What you want to do is make sure you don't cut through the binding, which I haven't. I've got two more to do. I want to work this way, so I'm going to be very, very careful. That's okay. And gentle. Don't force anything. That doesn't want to work, so I'm going to push it from this side. That's okay. Should we get stuck just there? So let's have a little look. bits of equipment. I don't know if I do my version of this. Oh, this is my do that one. Right, okay. 12 inch radius, we'll need this one. So we're gonna have a look. These slots are tight, but they are deep enough. Yeah, they are certainly deep enough. That is not gonna be a problem. Just enough there. Got to be deep enough because if it's not, we're in trouble. Yep, we're deep enough, and we are. We are deep enough. That's good news. Very good news. Very good. So we are more or less ready to get the new frets in. Now I would love to be able to put that pickup back in. I don't think I'm going to be able to. But we are ready for frets. How good is that? I'm not going to fret it on here. I do have new devices for fretting. I have a uh, big old fret press from, is it GMC? It cost me 500 quid. I'm not convinced by it just yet. But I do have a new hand fret press, which I've not used yet. Uh, knocking about somewhere. I, I'm going to use that up to here. And we'll see about, I might hammer them in at this end. We'll see, yeah, we'll see where we go on. So there you go. We are now ready to get the new frets in. How are we doing, guys? Okay, 
Um, I've just checked the neck. It is a week, over a week, because I've been away to London. Uh, it's well over a week since I straightened this guitar neck and it is still dead straight, which is fabulous news. You know, there's never a guarantee that when we straighten the neck, it's going to stay straight, but this has. So that is really, really good news. So now what I'm doing is I'm deciding what fret wire to use on this guitar. Now, it being a vintage guitar, I would like to be thinking that we're going to go with vintage fret wire. And I don't see why we wouldn't do that. Now, the old fret wire I've just measured was 2.6 mil wide. The vintage fret wire I have is 2.5 mil wide. So I think I'm going to go with that. The height of this is only 1.2 millimeters, by the way. Um, my, my modern stuff is 2.8 wide by 1.4 millimeter. I like to use a higher fret wire, but I'm going to go with the vintage. I've asked the, sell, the uh, client what he wants, he's not got back to me, but I've said, look, end of the day, I'm, I'm considering going with the, the vintage size. So it's 2.49 millimeters wide by 1.2 millimeters high. Because I've got the neck dead straight, I'm going to recommend we use this one. Now this is really good fret wire. This is Sintom's Elite. It's where your standard fret wire is 12% nickel silver and your hard, modern hard fret wire is 18% nickel silver. This is 25% nickel silver. It is a lot harder than your standard stuff. So it's gonna last a lot, lot longer. Uh, good thing about it is it's the same price as regular fret wire. I've got 12 quid on it, it actually costs 13 pounds. So it's 13 quid worth of fret wire. Um, what I need to do though now is I need to cut the fret wire to width for each fret because we're going over the binder so I'm going to need to snip the tangs off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut fret wire to size for each fret. I'm going to stick it in the block there and uh, we'll precision cut every single fret for the guitar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to straight over there, I'm going to take my snippers or my cutters, got these from GMI years ago. These yellow ones, they're brilliant, the cut as good as anything I've ever owned. And there you go, that's number one. And I should get five frets out of this, out of the first strip. Not that it matters, I've got loads of fret wire. But slightly overhang, because it does nip the edge of the fret wire and bend it over a little. I'm not going to have to bend it back, I'm just going to just go over slightly. Three. Oh, I've got loads over there. I can even use this one for this side here. So 22. And that one I might get five out of an extra. And that's for fret 22. And then we'll grab some more. So yeah, of course, so I'm going to cut this to size. I'm going to leave the camera running just for a little while just so you can. You know, basically you can come through this with me or, what, or see parts you don't normally see with me. I've got two, two or three packs of this stuff, this vintage stuff. So let's have a look, see what we've got here. I don't think I'll get two out of that. One, two, three, four, five. I definitely will get, I won't get two out of that. What have we got here? Point five. That's wide enough for four, it is nice, is it? Let's have a look. No, that's fine on three there, I'll leave that where it is. I've got plenty of fret wire, I don't know why I'm screw, trying to scrimp on fret wire. We'll just leave it there, it's fine. If I lose a piece, I'll lose a piece, it's no big deal. One, two, three, four, five. So yeah, just quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we go about removing the tangs. So five, but I'm going to cut these all to length. One, two, three, four, five, six. Nine, there you go, plenty there. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how we precision cut these frets. I don't know if they're wide enough or anything, that's not what I can do in the bin. So you may see that the frets have got a tang all the way to the end and it's no good. If we put the fret in like that it's going to cut through the binding. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the tang. And I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit closer just to give you a bit of a better view. So I've got this great piece of kit here, fret tang nipper. Expensive piece of kit. Again, this is made by Sintons. I do believe we're a Belarusian company. Fret tag nippers by Sintons up. There you go. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to remove the tangs at the end of each fret. It's just a matter of inserting it in the right place. Like so. And just removing the edge. I'm going to show you exactly what I've done in a second. If you look here at the end and at the end there, I've just removed the end of the tang there and the end of the tang there. I'm just going to check that fits and that more or less fits perfectly. So that's fret one done and that will fit right in there and it will not be cut through the binding because it's inside. So again, to just show where we are there cut away the square there right up to the top of the fret and that side and that will sit in the fret slot like so and that one's ready to go so I'm going to do the next one number two and again it's just a matter of nipping a little bit don't want to go mental I want them more or less I want these tangs right up the binding or as close to the binding as I can without it pushing the binding out. That's I've left too much on there. So it's just a but just keep going back and checking what you've done. Still not enough off there. You're probably going to see better on this one. I'll remove a tang that side and that side. Put my hand behind it and you should be able to see. Can you see there at the edges where I've removed that tang? So that's number two done. So I'm going to crack on. I'm going to get these all cut to size, all ready to fit. Once they are all cut, we're not quite ready to install them yet. I am going to, overnight, I'm going to drop some water in those slots. Not too much, just a little, just to soften those slots up a little. Might even go with some, in the past I've gone with some uh, mineral oil. Just to soften them up a bit, because the wood will be quite brittle, because it's an old guitar. But there you go, that's three done. Always making sure that the fret is wide enough, and it is. So I'm going to crack on, get all these done. Um, I've got the chips to repair yet. I've not even started doing the chip repair. I've been away, like I said, been to London with the wife. We had four days in London. Had a really good time. But anyway, there you go. One, two, three, four. Get a little bit more off that one. And uh, yeah, to London. Two breaks we've had this year so far. We've done Scotland and London. I think that's it for this year, as far as I know. One, two, three, four. That's beautiful. So that's four done. I'm going to crack on, get the rest of them done. Once that's done, I'm going to move on to filling up these chips areas. I'm not going to film me filling these chip areas. Uh, I've done it quite a few times before on videos. Uh, like I say, I'm quite busy at Royal Mail at the moment, so I'm not going to get to film everything, but hey-ho. Okay, for a friend. Fingerboard with some strips of, um, what do you call it? This stuff? Forgot. Silicon strips. Glue doesn't stick to silicon, so I'll put some in there, and we're going to be repairing the fingerboard. Or filling, rip, uh, repairing chips. Now, unfortunately, you can't really see 
much where you are and all the ships are going to need filling on the opposite side so if we've got one on your side we do have one this side this one here in particular this is fantastic so I can do it from here just need to grab a super glue and a little, a little attachment on there this is a really runny super glue I do buy this it's block super glue uh, I buy it because it's the runniest one I can buy and it's not expensive And what we're going to do is, I'm going to repair the chips, and there's a chips area just there, just a small one. And all we need to do is, I've got some alder and rosewood dust mixed here. I've had it for years. I'm just going to take a little bit of wood dust. I can show you this one because it's the side. You can see, I've got quite a few chips to repair. It's just a matter of getting some dust. On the crack there. Or on the chip. Now the silicon is going to stop the glue going into the slot. And all I need is a little drop of super glue. And that's it. And I'm just going to wick a little bit of extra powder in and just dob it down there and that's that one done and I've repaired that ship and all we do with the so can just bend it over and it should just pull out, the glue doesn't stick and that's come straight out. Oh it's taken another chip, well, that's great, it has taken another chip with it, that's fantastic though. Because what I can do now is, I can repair that chip as well. Nine times out of ten we're going to take, we'd take this and we'd replace it and put it back in there and glue it in. I'm not going to do that because it gives me a chance to show you how much how easy it is to repair anyway. So you now see we've got a big divot there. And we're not going to replace that piece of wood. We're going to we're going to fill the hole. So that could not have timed better. Again, just a drop of super glue. Don't worry about it being too proud or having too much wood dust there. I'm going to sand it smooth later. I'm just going to bring this in and over. And keep filling. It keeps pulling out, it does do that now and again. We'll let that set, and once that's set, we're going to come in with a bit of sandpaper and we'll smooth that off. 
Just give it a few seconds to dry. Did make a little bit of a pig's ear with that. It did take longer than it ought to have done, but that's okay. But we could have just put the chipped piece back in there, but I wanted to just show how we can do it just by filling. So again, let's just remove the strip. Take a piece of more coarse sandpaper. I think this is about 180 grit just here. You see when we turn that chip we can take. If I didn't have these little strips of silicon on here, I would take a file to remove the excess, but I'm just gonna Go with a Stanley blade at the moment. What I'd normally do is I'd use a file. Just see what we've got knocking about here. Because I've got these strips in, I can't really file it as I would, but we can just hit it with this. There you go, and that is that chip completely repaired. And once this fingerboard's all oiled up and everything, you are not going to see any join or anything. I'm just looking for a small saw. I have a Hosco saw, I can't see it at the moment, also left it out somewhere. A saw that goes in there, but we can just have a quick go with a blade just to clear the slot, and the slot should be fine. And there you go, because we had the silicon in there, the slot's still free. So we've repaired that area. You're certainly not going to tell once the fingerboard is all oiled up. I've got quite a few more to do, so I'm going to crack on, get the rest done, and uh, once it's done, we'll stand the board back down and we'll start to get the frets in. Just wanted to bring you back in because I found my little Hosco saw, and this is specifically for this job for clearing out the slots, and it has two cutters, one for each direction, so it's a push or a pull work both ways and it's just for clearing out the slots like so and making sure they're deep enough for the new frets you want to be very careful when you come up to the binding that you don't push or pull through the side of the binding or cut a hole in it because you want to keep the binding intact so you can start just here for instance and get straight in and just push away and then on your pull stroke, really take your time when you get towards the edge there. And that's it, that fret is now completely repaired, no chip, beautifully smooth and ready for a new fret. So I'm going to crack on, get all of the others done. It is going to take me a while, it's quite a long winded process. Uh, but take your time, don't get glue everywhere and remember to smooth everything down. So I'm now all done, ready for the frets. All the chipped areas have been fixed. Um, I've re-radius the board. 12 inch radius block, just with some 240 grit on there. Just smoothed it over, got rid of all the um, extra height and little bumps we got where we uh, filled the slots. That's as good as we're gonna get it. Any tiny little chips left here are gonna be covered by the frets anyway, so that's gonna be absolutely fine. I've got the frets all cut. I'm going to do a couple of test pressings just to see how they go in and then I'll decide whether I'm going to use glue or not. I don't normally glue frets in. I find they go in fine anyway. Now I'm expecting these to be a little, be a little bit more difficult to get in because the wood seems to be try, quite dry. I may have to fill the slots with mineral oil. You know it's lemon oil. And what I would do is I'd soak the neck 
I'd wick all the oil into the slots, let it sit for 24 hours, then I'd come and scrape it all back out. It could just soften the edges of the glue, but it will dry in time. But we just need to, to soften the edges of the uh, fret slot, shall I say. Um, but we need it to dry if we are going to glue them in, so it could be a long-winded process. I'm thinking, frets are a little bit more difficult to get in when you've not flared open the slots, because we've got binding on, we can't flare them open. We'd normally take a three-corner file and flare the slots open a bit. We can't do that. I've put them in without glue before, I've put them in without oil in before, and it's gone fine. It's just we may have the odd problem here and there. I'm going to take a fret and just have a look and see where we are. Fret one, like I say, these are already cut to size. Just a matter of lining it up and getting it ready to press in. They are, say, seem to be really, really tight. Whether it's going to go in that easy or not, I do not quite know. Might just do a test one right now. Looking for a 12. We're going to use a 12. And a nine and a half. We'll use a nine and a half just to press the edges in. Now I'm using a handheld fret press as well, which I've never used before. So we're just going to have a test with one fret. Let me get the right cubbies on the base here. I wasn't going to pay stupid money for a Stumac one of these because it was a stupid price. So I went a little bit cheaper with a company, just a third party company from Asia somewhere. But this is the kind of gear we're looking at. And um, I'll take a nine and a half call. I'm hoping this is magnetic. Is it magnetic? No, it's an Allen key jolly. So I'm going to get the right Allen key. Looks to be about a two and a half mil. Maybe I did get down the key in the pack, I don't quite remember. I'm going to press in with an iron off just to get the edges in. Let's try this one first. That's way too small. Too big, so I'm going to do two mil. I may buy another one of these so I've got two I can use at the same time. I've never used this. Let's just get it set up. Okay, far too slack. I don't like the fact that this is loose. I'd like this to have been a little bit more static, but there you go. That's not pressed in yet, so I need to go tighter. No, and that's not pressed in. Not impressed with this. Let's just keep going and maybe I'm just going to get used to it, that's all. I don't like how this is loose. There. Let's go again. Maybe, now, maybe this is just not for me, this piece of kit. I'm going to turn the guitar around and press it in from that side and see how we are. Bear with me a second. You're not going to see this. I'm going to go from the other side. So, a hand fret press. I've never ever used one before. It seems a little bit awkward to me. You can't see what I'm doing now, but I'm down the other end of the guitar. Oh, that seems to have gone in perfectly. Oh, okay. So it's going to take a little bit of getting used to this fret press, but let's, let's just have a look where we are. I'm going to change the call again. I do have other fret presses. I do have a static one, a big expensive one I bought from, I can't remember the name of the company now, it cost me about 500 quid. 
to use, which is probably, especially a great piece of kit, it's just not impressed me much. So do I have a 12 cord knocking about? 12 cord right here. I'll just use the 9 there just to get the edges in. I'm going to use a 12 now to press properly. I should just want to use a 12 anyway. I think with this, it's just about getting used to the tool itself. Seems to be, that seems to be around about the right area. Not tight enough there. Give it a go. We are, ha, ha, we are clamped in. I could maybe wick a little bit of super glue in there. I don't like the way this works, this clamp. It's nowhere near straight. It's going in at an angle, and that is not good. So, is it a case if you get what you pay for and I've gone cheap and it's not worked? Could well be. That seems to be going on in frets going in straight, but this is bending as you as you clump it in. Let's go there. I think you've got, think you've just got to be careful. So that fret is certainly in, and it's pressed in really nice. So I think it's just a, a matter of me having to get used to this tool. Um, certainly, I'm not impressed with how this sits in relation to that. It is bending. It's trying to buckle one way or the other. Uh, that's what happens when you're paying 70, 60 pounds or 70 pounds for one, when maybe I have to pay between 230, 240 pounds to get one from Stumac. Um, I'll soldier on with this, see how we go. I'll also set up my GMC contraction over there later on to press these ones in, so I'll show you how that works. Again, it's supposed to be a good piece of kit. It cost me 450 pounds, I believe. I'm not that impressed. With it, I bought the full version. I will show you more of that a little bit later. I'm going to go and press some frets in with this, and um, I'll come back and show you how we get on. As you can see, I've not glued that one in, so I'm not going to glue them in. I'm just going to press them in and see how we go. So I've moved away from the hand press, and this was a waste of money. Um, I know I wanted to get the Stumac one, which was a lot more expensive, but it would have been better. But the problem with this is the gap here with this. There's a gap, and this just bends, it bends the wrong way, it puts pressure the wrong way, and it just bends, it's not sturdy or stable enough, so I've wasted £70 on buying that, I'm going to go and get uh, a better one later, but I've moved on to my GMC fretting, is it a fretting jig, whatever, this cost me 450 quid. Uh, I'm not impressed with it at all. It's not, it's not a waste of money, it does work, it does do the job, but what I hate about this more than anything is the pressing calls, they don't have a groove, they're just smooth, so you've got to line it up perfectly. And this is too tricky to line up, and the reason it's too tricky to line up, none of this wood is square, some of it's slightly warped. When I got it and got it out of the box, I was a little bit disappointed because some of the metal was scratched and some of the wood has scratches in there. I never contacted the guy who built this piece of kit, but how it works is we've basically got this stanchion here and we wind the core down onto the top of the frets. Now I'm just unwinding it there, I can't really show you any better than I am. And then we move the guitar by undoing these things here and move on to the next one, the next fret. It doesn't even press the frets in properly, the edges. I've got a nine and a half inch core in there and it's just... <laughs> I think I've wasted my money on this. I don't think it's that good at all. I've still got to adjust it again just a little bit because it is not pressing the frets in enough. So I'm going to adjust it down just a little bit. Um, it's a shame I had to slag something off, especially something that is supposed to be fantastic and supposed to make the job easier. It, it doesn't make the job easier. It makes it a little bit more tricky. And it's never pressed the frets in that well, as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to bring it down so I can just Get more of a press. I don't want to bring it down, I don't want to bring it up. 
doing that the wrong way at the moment. No, I do want to read that. Sorry, I'm doing it the wrong way here. We'll bring it down about two millimetres. So I've got to undo so many things to get it right. This could be made so much better. In hindsight, I should have contacted the builder and just said, look, I'm not too happy with the condition of this or the state I got it in. It is not the best piece of kit. It should be, it should be fabulous. I mean, I say, I've not wasted 450 quid because it, hopefully it's still usable. It's just not as good as I thought. There's got to be better ways. And I don't know how many of these are sold or resells, but no idea. GMC is based out in Wales, I believe. I'm just going to reset this. It's just too finicky. You have, you have to change everything all the time. And from what I can see, it's not pressing the frets in that well. Now, I do have a friend, Lester Sharuthia, Danny. Then he was interested in buying one of these, he had asked me. And when I said I was buying one, so let me know what it's like, because he might go and buy one. Well, I might offer him this. Because, uh, I don't rate it myself. Now, I know there's people online who have gone and bought this and said, bro, it's the best thing. It isn't. The fact that those coils have no grooves on them makes everything more difficult than it needs to be. You've got to get everything lined up perfectly. And the thing is, the unit itself is not stable enough. It's got to be precision made if it's going to work properly. So, I'm leaving all this in. I always tighten these things up too much by hand. You get that annoying rattling you get as well. It is annoying. That's this thing. So now we've got that a little bit closer to the fret. And that should give me more press. Now, this thing just doesn't line up that well for me. That is until that's where I need to be. And that's pressed right down. I'm just hoping it bends all the way in. I'm using a nine and a half inch call on that. I should be using a 12. But the radius is a little bit tighter. Uh, see, that definitely looks better. I'm going to move the camera so you can see what I'm doing. Um, it's a shame I'm having to slag it off a little bit. It's just when you pay £450 for a tool, you want it to work properly, and it's it's just too difficult. There you go. You've certainly got a better view now. We've got the guitar nice and stable. The problem I find with this is you've got to get it lined up perfectly. I'm going to unwind it, and this is how the mechanism works, you see? It looks like you've got to get it perfectly lined up, and once it's lined up, you can press the fret in. Like so, I find that it's really difficult to line up because there's no groove in here. And we're actually a bit too far on this side. So again, we've got to slightly move. I've got to do these again. It doesn't sit square, I found as well, which is really annoying. I have to kind of do it at an angle. The fact that it doesn't sit square is I've either got the guitar lined up wrong. And as soon as it comes down, it's missing again. So there you go, and that's how it works. To me, that's just a bit too fiddly. Am I doing something wrong? And then, I'm now going to come and change the call. 
again, which is I can't get enough adjustment there. So I'm going to move the guitar, slide this out, slide this out, go and grab the next one, slide that back in. Is it me or is this, you know, am I just being picky here? Again, line it back up, line it up, lock it down. That's just support from underneath, that's never sat too safely, which is a shame because I need this support underneath. So I just find the whole mechanism awkward, and the whole thing awkward, and it shouldn't be. Just going with a 12 inch call, which is the correct call. And I'll just hold that in there. And that fret should be in. That's taken me 10 minutes to put one fret in. I could hammer them in a lot quicker. So that's my dilemma. It works, it's working. That fret's not even down at the corner look. It's not even down at the edges. I'm gonna to have to hammer that in anyway. So, so there you go, that's my dilemma with this piece of kit. For £435 plus shipping, £450 something pounds. It's not as good as it ought to be, in my opinion. So the frets are in, just nipping off these uh, ends, just up to the binding so it can make it easy to find uh, file, sorry file the uh, bevels later on. I better slightly tap these in with a um, fretting on that afterwards. The fret presses I bought, the handheld press is just is crap. I should have just shelled out the one if it was Streamac one. It's going to cost about four times more than that one but it's going to be worth it. The GMC fret press which cost me nearly 500 quid. I've just not, I've never been impressed with it since I bought it. I don't think it was made that well. The wood on it is warped. I'm going to contact the builder and just say, look, it's never worked right since I've had it and see what he says. Um, I will keep it. I'm going to try and move it on. I'm going to see if Danny at uh, Leicester Shalithi wants to buy it because he was on about buying one. And I'll do him a reduced price. Well, it doesn't press the press all the way in. I'm going to tap these edges in here. Anyway, the frets are in. I'm going to let that sit overnight and come back and check them again in the morning. And once it's done, we're going to look to getting them, getting the bevels done, get the edges done, get the bevels done, and get them leveled. But that'll be something I'm going to be doing tomorrow. I'm going to move on to something else tonight. So, back soon. Moving on to fret leveling. And um, I've been across with a fret rocker, marked off the high spots or the higher spots on the frets. Um, and one of them is I'm not going to be doing it completely with the levelling beam, which is my Crimson Guitars one, 240 grit on this side, which we use for remaining uh, for removing the main material, and 400 grit on the bottom side. Sorry, on the top side for smoothing off. So 240 grit there to remove the main, 400 grit to smooth it off and remove some of the scratches. But before I do that, I'm actually going to go across with my leveling file. Now this is a Chris Allsop leveling file I bought a couple of years ago. It's a diamond file. It is precision flat and where I've marked these frets we're going to remove these high spots and this will remove a lot of material quickly and once it's removed the amount of material it needs to it'll start hitting the other frets. So I'm going to do everything in one go. Over here I've got the full fret needs leveling so we're going to just level the lot. Gentle but firm pressure. Following the radius, that means when I get to here, I'm going to slightly overlap because it gets thinner in. We always follow the radius at a 90 degree angle. So when it gets to this, I'm going to be overlapping even more. You only follow the lines of the neck of the strings when you're doing a compound radius. So I'm going to go a little bit gung-ho at it.
and the fire will let me, the fire will let me know when we're level because it will be will be less resistant. It will glide across much more smoothly. I'm going to brush off the fingerboard. I'm going to check the frets again with the fret locker and see if we still have any hard spots. If we do, we'll go across again with the file. So I can already see the bits I've hit with the uh, file, especially there. Pretty good at the moment. I still expect to find a few more high spots. Now you may be wondering why I've not got this in the neck jig. The reason I've not got it in the neck jig is I've already checked the neck. The neck is dead straight. I've made, had a not straight edge on there. And we're hardly going to get any movement because I don't need to remove a lot of material. So we're not going to get a lot of movement. So I'm fine just holding it in the neck rest here. Bear with me. Pardon the interruption, that was Amazon delivering something or someone delivering something on behalf of Amazon. It's in the wife's name, so uh, oh right, fine, not a problem. It's my dog tablets for me dog, keep him healthy and stuff. That's all good. So back to checking these frets. pretty good yeah so the reason I've not got it in my neck jig is we're hardly going to the guitar's hardly moving we don't need it strapped in there. if we had the neck where the neck was not where the neck was not properly straight we'd have to clamp it in but we do have a straight neck because I straightened the neck if you remember uh, the neck is dead straight it's come out really really well so I'm really really pleased with how this guitar has come out like I say it is a vintage it is in 1972, it is worth a lot of money. And you want to be doing things right. What I like about his frets is I've stuck with the original size frets as well. I've not gone with jumbos, which is always tempting to stick some jumbos in there. But these frets are level, which is fabulous. Now what we're going to do is we are going to level with leveling beam and let me explain about the leveling beam this is from crimson guitars a great piece of kit costs around 30 pounds these two edges are milled perfectly flat that edge and this edge and like i said i've got 240 grit on this side 400 grit on this side to remove the main material do the main leveling i'll use the 240 once that's done i'll go across with the 400 grit which will remove some of the deeper scratches now all the scratches are going to go in this way but when we come to polishing the frets, we're going to polish the frets that way. So it's going to remove all of the scratches. So what I need to do now is, I'm going to cover the tops of all of the frets. And I'm going to use a permanent marker. Because that way, once it's all removed, we know we've got the frets level. Now it shouldn't take too long to level these, because it should be pretty much level. Now I'm going to answer another question you might be thinking of. Or a lot of people ask this question, how can you use a leveling beam? Just a straight leveling beam instead of a radius beam because I do have radius beams. In fact, I have a set of two radius beams for all sizes. And we tend to use radius beams for re radiusing a fingerboard. I don't know why we don't radius frets with them, but we just don't. We just, we just use a leveling beam, this one, the flat one. And I've always used it. And it will not, you will not knock your radius. Using this other thing, people tend to think you do. What if we take more material off another side? Well, you're not going to because I always keep my eye on the frets. And you can, not from your angle, but from my angle, looking down on the frets, you can always tell how much material you removed. And you remove the same amount on an average from each fret. So there you go. So we've marked all of the frets up. Make sure we've got a 240 grit down. And we're just going to move backwards and forwards. And like I say, we're going to follow the radius. So it's the full width of the radius. So when we get to here, we're going to overlap. Because we're keeping 90 degrees with this fret. So it's going to overlap slightly. If we did follow that line, it'd be like we're doing on a compound radius. But to keep a static radius, you need to keep the file straight. So we're just going to, just a few strokes, backwards and forwards. 
Now you see why I've got everything embedded in the guitar and taped over. Uh, this file, this uh, leveling beam can hit nothing. It's not going to hit a pick up, it's not going to hit any of the uh, posts or anything. It's not going to hit the knots, it's not going to hit any of the tuners because everything's out of the way. And we're just going to, again, we're not pressing down that much. Gentle firmness. Straight line. Following the radius. Concentrate a little bit more on this end. But the reason being, these frets are closer together, so you need to get a little bit more pressure on this end. Making sure we're not removing too much material from this side, which is easily done when they're more spaced apart. Of all of these frets are now silver so it means we should oh no we've got a little bit of a black spot there it means we've got one high fret either this side of this area or this side so we're just going to find out where so a little bit of black on that side there and there's your corporate one right next to it look this one found it straight away normally if you've got a black mark there it means there's a fret still high around it so we're just going to concentrate on that one fret. We're going to check it again. We no longer have a high spot, so we're going to brush off again. Pen again. And we're going to level again, but this time we're going to level with a 400 grit, because I know we're very close to being level along the whole length. We'll put some quite deep scratches in these frets that way. It's a little bit dark today, as you may notice. The reason it's dark is I can't pull my blind up. The blind has broke. I've, I've ordered a new one. We'll pick it up in a minute from Argos. It's ready to collect. I've got a new blind going in that window. Now, the blind I've had in there, I think I've had it in for about five or six years. And it was only six ninety nine. and it's like a bamboo roll up line it's been fantastic but it's given up the ghost it's been a great piece of kit i bought a little bit better when i bought a venetian blind type of fair pvc one cost double the price of that cost 11 quid i'm sure it's going to be fine but anyway back to where we are i'm going to go now with the 400 grit and we're going to remove some of these scratches and all being well we'll get rid of all the pen in a few strokes showing us that the frets are level that's one side done already. Still a little bit more here, so it's saying we've got a high fret somewhere down here still. Same one again. black pen just to make sure we are level it is possible we've got a fret popping back up it's not seated right what we're going to do is we're going to take a red pen this time reason being I don't use these colored pens much and I still need to use them these are the two that show a little bit high Yeah, 
Once we've done the bevels, which I saw earlier, we do the levels, then we do the recrowning, then we do roll over these edges. These edges are really sharp at the moment, they're digging into my fingers a little bit. I don't want my fingers through them, but we will get them super smooth and you won't feel them. But you've got to do things in the right order. Bevel, level, crown, polish. Okay, I've got a brush. The beam, this paper we'll put on by the way, will last three or four or five jobs. Just because it's used, it doesn't mean you have to discard it. It still works. So again, 400 grit, red pen. So all the tops of the frets are silver. I'm just checking the thickness that we've got an even amount on each side. Could go a tiny bit. Now we're looking pretty good there. Could go a tiny bit more this side. Just make sure I'm 400 down. Things about using this beam is we're not removing a lot of material, we're just leveling off. And that, my friends, looks fabulous. So we're going to check the level, we're going to do a precision check, so we're going to take his time, we're going to listen for a rock anywhere. because once we're level we know we've done our job right really pleased with this job we don't forget we had a bent neck when we came in we straightened the neck i didn't charge a lot i only charged 75 quid for straight my neck i should be charging a lot more than that i still have another neck to straighten before i refret i've got another refret in i'm going to be concentrating my efforts more on refrets and fret work in the future I'm going to do a video about that pretty soon because I don't have time to be doing loads of setups anymore. So I'm going to be making less money, but I'm going to enjoy the work a lot more. I'm going to be concentrating my efforts more on refrets and fret levels rather than setups. So it may be that I'm going to have to start refusing some work because I'm that busy at Royal Mail at the moment. I can't get in the workshop. And people don't mind waiting for refrets when they get in such a good job done anyway these frets these frets are level along the whole length of the neck the neck is straight 1972 les paul p90 version les paul with a repaired now straightened neck with brand new level frets the next part of the process is we're going to recrown these frets by recrown i mean in because we're leveled them that way they all have we are now flat, we need to build that crown going that way. Once we've rebuilt the crown, we're gonna roll over these edges and we're gonna get them polished up. So before I can crown them, I need to tape up the fingerboard, just leaving the frets exposed. And uh, once I've got that all done, I will come back, I'll bring the camera in and I'll show you how to recrown the frets. Crowning frets, and um, we are blessed today to have an array of fantastic tools at our disposal to do the job and I use a Stumac Z file and the great thing about this is it has two cuts so the closest to you is a long shallow cut and nearer to me there's a shorter deep cut you turn it 180 degrees and it's a complete opposite um, the great thing about this is it can cut a different cut each side so you do it one way turn it 180 degrees to the other but it will not touch the top of a fret so because we've got all of the frets level we're not going to remove any material from the top but it is going to build up that beautiful crown for us so it's easier to show than it is to explain. So, 
follow the radius of the neck, turn the fire 180 degrees to exactly the same. And we now have a nice thin black line running down the middle of the fret. Now you may need to do it a couple of times just to get that fret right. Bear with me a second, I forgot to pick up the plug. Always wipe the file between frets. And I'm looking for a width of around about half a millimetre on the top of the fret there. It doesn't have to be exact, we're just trying to minimise the point of contact between the string and the top of the fret. And once we've been across with that file, we'll then take a proper crowning file. Another one, this has already got the concave cut in there, but this will remove any burrs. I, only do, I don't do the top, I just do the edges. And any unevenness, and then we'll just come over the edges there, just to round those off. And that is a beautifully crowned fret. I'll show you one more time. We don't need to explain as much, just crack on. done got 20 odd more to do we're going to crack on get them all done once that's done we can come back and I'll show you how we polish the frets so now the frets are all crowned one thing I need to do is just roll over these beveled edges they're not as sharp as they were because I've been over with a file but I still need to finish them off so what we're going to do is we're going to take again a small Stumac file and this has got two safe edges, there's no teeth on that part, there's no teeth on that part. And this file, I'm not going to zoom in, is just for rolling over these beveled edges. Just here you can see, just one each side and one over the top. And all I'm going to do is just soften these beveled edges there. And I will again roll those over with some sandpaper later on. So it's going to be even smoother, but you're not going to feel them. But this is going to remove that little burr or anything remaining of any burrs just to soften these edges and when you run your hands up there you're not going to feel the frets it's just a matter of three strokes nice and steady and the goodness of the safe edge means you're not going to be digging into this paper or digging into the fingerboard because you've got that safe edge underneath it's nice and simple, just roll over. I can only do this side. What I do is I just turn the guitar around 180 degrees to do the other side. So I can work in the same direction. And there you go, it really is that simple. So I'm going to do this off camera, but this will be it for today with this guitar. We're getting towards, it's just gone 6 pm. I'm ready for my dinner, then I've got to go out and pick up a guitar. I've got to go and pick, um, pick some stuff up from the shop. So that's going to be it for today. So just roll these few on camera. Might as well show you one full side. It doesn't take long, look. It's all about experience. Just need to be a little bit more careful when you get over the guitar body. time on this part because I'm working over the guitar body now so less of an angle a few more strokes just to get the same effect maybe I will turn the guitar around and just show you how I work over the body 
on this side where it's going to be a little bit more careful. Okay, so a little bit more careful here because I'm working right over the body now. So let me just give the file a quick clean. Okay, so now I'm working. I don't want to be prodding down into the even though I've got a safe edge there. I don't I still don't want to be prodding into the guitar body. So I'm going to a slight less angle, but I'm going to go a bit more forward and back on these few. Just a couple of extra strokes because I'm working over the body. So. Just be a little bit more careful. Just rolling over as I go. You can't see where I'm filing, but I can because I'm at a different angle. I've got the light shining on the frets from the other side of the workshop. And I can see exactly where I filed. But again, small strokes great little tool this and it wasn't expensive 89 pounds I believe and Dan Owen's got a video on, on doing this and using these tools I've watched I've watched all of Dan Owen's videos over the years Learned so much from that guy. And we've done the ones over the body, so back to normal. Just three strokes should get us there. Three or four. Nice and simple. It's a great file. Yes, I love using this file. So I've ended up keeping video running for the whole lot. Well, I'm going to now anyway. So once this is done, that's the frets installed, beveled, leveled, recrowned, rolled over these beveled edges. And we're now ready for the next stage, well, we'll be after I've done this, which will be the polishing. And we'll polish not to bring them just to a shine, but we'll polish to remove all the scratches as well. We know the frets are level because we've not touched the tops. I've checked again anyway, but we'll still keep checking as we, even as we polish, we may lose a bit of height or so. So we'll always make sure that the level is right. So we'll check again. Uh, I'll also be rolling over these beveled edges with sandpaper later on, just to smooth them a little bit more. But yeah, there you go, that is done, and that's using this little Stumac file, specifically for this job. Uh, great piece of kit, this. And, uh, yeah, little Stumac beveling file beautiful piece of kit good morning friends we are 6 15 a.m on a saturday morning and uh, i've taken to doing a little bit of work before i go to work at royal mail i start at royal mail at seven o'clock so uh, i've been that busy i've not been able to get in the workshop so i'm doing a little bit before i go out so what i'm going to be doing is i've got six different grits of sandpaper here for polishing the frets you know how it works I've got a piece of 400 grit here just to remove the pen and the deepest of the scratches so, I'm going through, like I say, with seven grits. But we're just going to be polishing this way. Just to remove the pen. As the pen is removed, these deep scratches going that way are also more or less removed. And I only polish in this direction, forwards and backwards. And we polish not only to bring them to a shine, but also to remove all of the scratches. So it's going to take me a while. I'll be using, in effect, eight different grits of sandpaper. Then I'll finish off with five grade steel wool, so you're looking at 180 plus 
polish this, so it's going to take me a while. And then rather than film it all, I'm going to crack on, get it all done off camera. And hopefully, I'll have this done more or less before I go to work this morning. And when I come back, we've just got to put a nut on there, we can get the guitar set up. So I've been through with the seven grits of paper from 400 grit right through to 2000 grit. 400 grit I used to remove the deeper of the scratches. And we're polished just in this direction. They're all polished up bar. I've not finished with the steel wool yet. So we're just going to have a, with super fine steel wool. This is the finest grade you could get. It's, uh, it, it's super fine basically, grade 0000. It's a brand new piece off the roll. And it's just a matter of getting right over there, pinching over the top and getting right in. And trust me guys, these frets will be glass-like when they're done. Just stunning. Best part of the job this. Now, when I've done this, I need to cut a new nut and place a new nut or replace the old nut, put a new nut in there, new bone nut. Um, and I've been carving them by hand and sanding them by hand and it's a lot of work. So I've gone and ordered myself a, a belt sander today and a disc sander all in one machine. Now it's not going to be here. I don't think it's going to be here till next week. So I'm going to have to drop off this. I could do it by hand, but it's going to take me two or three hours to get it right. And with a belt sander, it can take me about 10 minutes to cut the bone to shape. So I'm going to wait till it arrives. I've always done them by hand. But I thought it was about time I had a belt sander. Uh, the thing is at the moment the one I want is not in stock, it's going to take about seven days. So I'm hoping it's going to be here within the next week. Oh, far too much steel wool here. But what I'm doing, I'm going, to, I'm going to split that in two. And trust me, oh my goodness, these frets are beautiful. The best part of the job is it's the hardest part of the job. Well, not the hardest part of the job, but the hardest part is actually using the sandpaper. But this is the most rewarding part. Once you've got these done, you peel off the tape. In fact, is it the most rewarding? Spraying the fingerboard with oil, wiping the oil off, and seeing how beautiful the frets are. It's just fantastic. But I've checked every time I've done something on these frets, I've checked that they're still level. They are level across the whole length of the neck which is fantastic. I've been commented so much on my fret work lately. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is asking people I've worked for this year to start. I've not been left any reviews for I don't know how long now, but I could do some more recent reviews. So everyone I've worked, every guitar I've worked on this year, I'm going to ask the people to come review fret friends because I'm going to be running an ad in some of the larger magazines soon. Uh, we're going to go big time. So I want to get my reviews all up to date. Uh, because I, you don't know what's going to happen if I stick an ad. I'm going to go with uh, some of the local rags, Chad, Voice, whatever. 100,000 uh, people will get to see stuff like that. Just see how things go. I think it's worth me just sticking an ad somewhere and seeing what that does because uh, there is a lot of competition out there. And uh, I'm not bragging, but you know, I know I'm good when it comes to threat and network. It's my thing, and if I can create a niche and just specialise more in frets and necks, you know. An independent guitar tech and or luthier is always going to give you a better job than a shop, a guitar shop, if you go to a music shop. Always, if you go to a music shop, always ask to meet the tech. Ask them about their experience, check the reviews. But there you go, that's the frets done, and they are stunning. Really, really good. So that's it, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not cutting it up by hand, I really can't be bothered. I've got other guitars to be getting on with. I'm going to wait till my new belt sander gets here. It's a belt sander, it's a bench top belt sander uh, with a disc sander built in as well. Wasn't cheap, um, but wasn't expensive. And if it works well, you know, it doesn't matter what the expense is. But anyway, that's it. So all I'm doing on this for now. Um, could peel off the tape. We'll have a look. See where we are. Now this tape's been on a while. It can be a bind to get started when it's been on a while. 
I'll put this long strip down the down this side there so we can peel it off. It's not as low tack as you might think. It's supposed to be low tack tape. Now probably old guitars like this you can pull off lacquer. You've got to be very very careful. And sometimes you've got to play a little. That looks wonderful. I'm going to just show you that end. Oh my goodness! Did I say I was good at this? I'm good at this. I'm just going to grab a guitar and just show you these frets. There you go. How wonderful are those? Absolutely stunning. Now once I get some oil on this fingerboard, these are going to pop. They are beautiful, nice and smooth. A job well done. So, on hold for a short while till we can get the uh, nut shaped and fitted. Um, I'll see you. I'll see you soon. I've just peeled off the tape. I'm going to leave that bit of tape on because I've not got the cover on that pickup yet. I can remove the tape from this pickup. Always been careful because it has happened in the past on an old guitar, I ripped lacquer off. Now the lacquer's all intact all over this guitar so we don't have a problem with that. But there you go and um, wow these frets just beautiful. So I'm get rid of that. I do need to refill this bottle with mineral oil but we've got enough just to I think we've got enough just to get some on here for now. And I'll use my hand Give it a nice, good, generous coating of mineral oil, just so we can. Uh... Oh, look at that! It's beautiful. I wonder if it's going to wipe this off. I don't want to put too much on there right now. But this will show you the grain. It'll pop the. It'll pop the grain. It'll show you how highly polished and how wonderful these frets look. Now, remember, we did have nibs on here before we've gone over the nibs so we've got a much wider fret on the guitar now and this is just so that excess that I've got on that rag now will remove any of that tape residue and just give you an idea of how Good. These frets look now. It's the best angle I can get for now, but there you go. That's the new frets installed, and they look stunning. So while I'm waiting for my new belt sander to arrive, or, or my first belt sander to arrive, which is going to make me or enable me to carve and shape nuts and saddles and whatever more easily. This is what I normally use and it's painstaking but it's quite a simple device but it is effective, it does work. And this is a chest of drawers I have under one of my workbenches and uh, I'm only pulling the drawer open just to be able to pull it out to show you how I'm going to carve nuts. And this is basically it, but it's something as simple as some sandpaper taped to a flat top or not taped in this case. And that's it. And I'll take a piece of bone, a bone not like that, and I painstakingly sand it till I get the thickness I like. That can happen sometimes, as you just saw, so I take some of it. But yeah, it really is that simple. And I'll just keep sanding and sanding till I get the bone to the thickness I need for the nut. Then the rest of it is really quite simple. That dust, I could collect that dust and save it if I wanted to. I've already got a lot of bone dust anyway, so I'm not going to save that. But there you go. Simple but effective. Now imagine how much quicker this is going to be using a belt sander. I'm lucky to take about a millimetre thickness off this bone. It's going to take me a while. But once I've got it to the thickness I want, I will go to a more, a finer piece of sandpaper. 
up to 400 grit. And that'll give me a nice smooth finish. And uh, there you go. So yeah, as you can see, it doesn't really remove a great amount of material. Uh, but it is effective and it does work and it's all I have for now. Having rough shaped the nut on my uh, belt sander, I'm going to do the rest with hand files. And I'm just going to have a look at that and we are a little bit wider than we need to be which is fantastic news for me because it means that I can still alter a little bit more. I've got the angle on that not quite as I want it so I'm going to remove so I'm going to use my fret levelling file it's a diamond file here and this should remove quite a bit of material quickly and it's all going to be done by hand in fact it's not removing enough material I'll go to this nice course again another fret levelling file a bevelling file this was great piece of kit My Swiss file by Valorb, number four cut, super smooth but super sharp. And the bone, I'm going to age this bone. I'm going to drop it in some, either some tea or something. I'm just going to have a look, see where we are with that. Okay, I've got it wrong way around. So from now, when it comes to gluing this bone in, I'm going to glue it in using epoxy. Right, now that is the width I need it to be. That's nice. That is more or less perfect. That's looking really really good there. So now I need to rough shape the top. Again I could have done this on the sander. I prefer to do it by hand. Make sure we get this fit right. One more thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to scrape out this slot here. I'm not going to get a file in there, I'm going to get a scraper in there <coughs> just to remove the old glue because there's some bits, stubborn bits in this corner down here. And I could take this file, we have a flat safe edge there, it's a dead straight file, so with the safe edge at the bottom. I could just remove any excess glue that's hiding away in here. And with that being a safe edge, we're not going to cut any depth off the shelf. We're just removing old glue from this face there. And once we start hitting rosewood, which we have done, we know we've removed enough. So again, checking for fit, and that sits in a lot better now. I've removed that old glue that sits in there flush. Really, really happy with that. That is wonderful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to final shape this nut on the guitar. We've got a tiny little bit of a gap there, but that's not a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to epoxy this in. I'll do all the final shaping by hand. I'm just going to shape this top ever so slightly. So you see where that black line is. And you know what? I'm going to put the sander back on. I'm going to shape it on the sander. It'll make things a lot, lot quicker. So why I go off and do that, I'm just going to give that one little file. Just remove any glue that is in there. Ever so, ever so lightly. Sounds that this file is the same width as the slot, and all I'm doing is I'm making sure that the base is flat, and I'll tell when I slide this in, and that feels really good. So, we're definitely going to get a great contact there. So, I'm not going to glue this in just yet. I need to, I do need to cut this and stain it a little. I mean, I could just stick it in like that, and it'll be fine. Just I'm thinking maybe I should just try and age that just a little bit. I'm going to carry on doing this by hand. 
because it gives it that just something special about hand cutting a knot. And this is going to take me a while, so but you see we are cutting into it there. I wonder if this one will work any better. I'm certainly not going to do any harm. We are starting to shape not. You know what? I'm going to put it back on the sander, on the disc sander. So let me go and have a play about with the disc sander, get this close to where I need it to be, and I'll finish off with this file or either or these files, and we'll start getting this ready to go back on the guitar. So I'll rough cut it on the disc sander, and that looks a lot, lot better. So we've more or less got the shape we need there. That is looking really, really good. Really, really pleased with that. So, the fine adjustments I need to make, I'm going to be using my number four cut Swiss file because this is super sharp and super smooth and it's a great fine cut. And I'm just going to, basically, this is a shape I'm going to want it to be. So you see, we're getting that lovely shape. I've already eyed it from the other side and that is looking really, really good. And this is just going to, Remove any of the inconsistencies I've got from the sander, from a disc sander. I'm going to soak this in some tea overnight just to give it a little bit of a edge look. And I know I've not cut the slots yet and the slots, it doesn't matter about them being tinted really because they're going to be through, the strings are going to be in there anyway. But I'm just going to soak this overnight. I'm not going to glue it tonight. But what I will be doing is this edge, I'll be rounding this over. So we remove all that pen. I can do it just now, like this. And I'll get some sandpaper on this and just rolling it round. Just to shape it so it's not, not anything abrupt in there. And you see we're already removing that. Normally I'd have done these completely with files and sandpaper. And it would take me a while. Normally I glue them in, then shape them on the guitar. But I'm going to do most of the work on this one off the guitar. I can do the final shaping on the guitar if I need to do anything. But there you go, that is becoming a rounded knot now. And what I can do is I can go back to my older methods of some sandpaper on a flat surface and I can work the knot that way. I've got some, I don't know if you can see it where you are, you probably can't, but it's on here. I'm going to use a little bit now just to round over. like a knot. We've rounded this over really nicely. We do need to get some sandpaper on there. I'm going to grab some um, Ford grip. I thought I had some knocking about but I don't. I'm just going to pull my piece off. There's some nice 400 grip there. I'm just going to start rounding this top over. And again, I can do a little bit more of this once it's on the guitar if I want to. I like to, I'm going to try not to. I want to get it done off the guitar because, like I say, I'm going to stain it. Give it an age look. 
but that is taking away just a little bit of sharpness here I need to remove. taking shape now and there you go how do you think that's going to look in there okay it is too white I do know that but that is a beautiful shape it's a beautiful size and that's more or less bar it being stained yeah that is more or less ready to go in Need a bit more work on this side removing any sharpness on this back side. There's a guy, Kenny Berg, he's been watching my videos for years and he started guitar teching. And uh, he says he gets so much inspiration from my videos and I've watched him cut these knots and the guy is a master. He's only young, mid twenties, and he's so, so good. And I'm really proud that he's watched my videos and he says, I love watching your videos. I've learned so much from your videos. You know, so that's, that's great for me. But that guy, he's going to be, one day he's going to be a really good luthier. From Denmark. He's got a channel, Guitars and, is it Guitars and Things? On YouTube, check him out. And there you go, and that's a beautiful shape. So, I'm going to square this off, smooth it off, stain it overnight. Hopefully we can get a little bit of a yellow in there. And I will come back in a day or two, tomorrow or whatever, and show you how it turns out. Good morning, Fred friends. So, a couple of things have happened overnight, which I'll just get to in a second. So, what we've done is, the original truss rod knot was on there really tight and uh, the thread was not too good so what I've done is I've been in there with a wire brush I've cleaned up all the thread on the truss rod nut I've lubricated the nut, I've lubricated the thread so I'm going to lube a little bit more just using some regular mineral oil because I don't have any um, don't have any lip balm or Vaseline to hand at the moment so we're just going to go with oil again and then this nut should go on a lot, lot quicker. You see I protected the area around and this nut should now go on really easily. Whereas before it was really tight, it's quite difficult to get off. And look at that, it's gone straight on all the way. Not a problem at all, so that is fine. So we can remove all of this. And we're ready to put the guitar back together. Now, also overnight, <coughs> I'm going to show you the old knot, and that's the old knot. <clears throat> and it was cut too low, it had a shim underneath, and it wasn't very good. It is bone, but it wasn't cut very well. So overnight, well, last night I cut a new knot, and I looked at it and I thought it's too white, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stain it. And I stained it overnight. And all I did was, and it's probably a little bit darker than I would have liked, but doesn't that look fantastic? Piece of bone which I hand carved, and I've stained it in regular tea. I made myself a cup of tea, and then I left the tea bag in the cup with about that much hot water. Stirred it, stirred it, stirred it, dropped this in. I also dropped in some Worcestershire sauce and um, a little bit of soy sauce just to darken it a little bit. And I just let it sit in the heat and let it seep overnight. And that is the result. And I think that is going to look just fabulous in there. The fit is perfect. It's as good as any knot I've ever cut that. So the fit is perfect, so all we need to do is cut the slots in the top. I'm going to cut the slots in the top once the knot is on the guitar. I'm hoping it's not too low, because it's close. But just looking at it here, eyeballing it here, that's not too low, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. In fact, I think it's perfect. So, old knot, new knot. Which do you prefer? 
I can't go with the old one. It looks really, really aged. It really looks apart. So, I'm going to get this nipped up just a little. I'm not going to tighten it, I'm just going to nip it up. We are early hours of the morning, by the way. Now 6.35 in the a.m., obviously. But there you go. And that has just nipped right to its edge, right there. So it's not putting any pressure on the neck, but that knot is fine. It's not, it's lubricated, it works properly, the thread is cleaned up. So we aged the knot, repaired the truss rod adjuster there, or, or, or cleaned it all up, made it work better. We replaced the knot. This is after a full refret. Uh, but before that, remember, we had to straighten the neck and remove a twist from the neck. So it's had a lot of work, but we are getting to where we want to be. The frets look absolutely fabulous. I'll put the pickup cover back on. <clears throat> so all I need to do is put the electrics back in, put the freeway switch back in, should I say. <clears throat> get the covers on. And we can look at getting this nut glued in a little bit later. I'm going to uh, set the nut with a uh, with an epoxy resin. Rather than just super glue. I'm not a fan of super glue at all. I hate the stuff. So I'm going to go with epoxy in there. And... Um, I may do it before I go to work. Just set some epoxy in and let that sit. And I'll come back and show you the result a little bit later. Just wanted to show how I set up for a nut being glued in. And I've taped along the binding this way, both sides, and I've taped across and across. So any glue spillage or any glue squeeze out we get will not go on the guitar. And that bit is just overlapped just a little bit just to help um, me seat the nut correctly. So I need to make sure the nut is oriented the correct way, which it will be. Excuse me. And again, we'll try that again. Yep, and there you go. It's just a matter of setting the nut where it needs to be. It can't go too far. And that will be perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up some epoxy resin. 30 minute. So all I have. And I'm going to set some in there and we're going to set the nut and let it settle. It's 30 minute epoxy, so it'll be set in, in 30 minutes. Yeah, so I'm going to crack on with that. Once that's done, I'll come back and show you the results later on. If we need to do any cleanup, I'll show you how I go about that as well. Hey guys, so I'm very fortunate this week to have some time off from Royal Mail. Now there's a good side and a bad side to that. Bad side being, I had an accident at work on Saturday and I, I slipped and fell on some wet moss covered wood near someone's house. It's the second time I fell in that place. But long story short, I got a big, my water bottle is a big stainless steel flask and I'm 14 stone and I fell right onto it in a vertical position, it smashed me in the chest. It's done all these ribs in here. They're not broken. If they're broken, I won't be here talking now. I won't be able to talk. But I've been laid up three days, and I'm not going to do any work. But on the upside, my manager last week had put me down for a week's annual leave, which I didn't know about. He told me, uh, I think he told me Saturday morning. I thought, well, that's great. That's before I had accident. I thought, good. And fortunately, today, on the Tuesday, I'm in the workshop. So we're, I'm going to give you an update again on this guitar. So the problem with the um, bridge is over the years, the bridge has gone that way, meaning the radius is more or less flat. But there's no question of me trying to bend that back and straighten it. Now, I'm just going to show you on here. So Gibson patent number, Gibson patent number 2740313 or thereabouts. Hopefully you can pause that and have a look. And when replacing these, you're going to want to go with the equivalent type of affair. So I had two choices, go with the equivalent, which would be a Tone Pros type of affair, or go with something a little bit more modern, a little bit more updated. And I chose to go with the Goto, the G103B in a nickel finish. So that gubbins. Now the reason I chose that is, well, whatever cheap, it was remarkably cheap. 
But the great thing about these is they are on a similar type post. Actually, I didn't know at the time. They're not the Imperial size that the Gibsons are. They are on a 4 mil post, so it wouldn't do any. But the great thing I love about these is you get so much more adjustment for intonation. Now, we could have got away with that, but would we have wanted to drill for 4 mil of a 4 mil? 4 mil screws? No, I would not have done. So I put it to the owner of the guitar and I says, look, what do you want to do? Do you want to go period correct? Or not so much period correct as Gibson correct for the time. Or do you want me to put this with more adjustment on? He says, no, I want to go, I want to go period correct or what have you. Uh, not more period correct or, or you see, you don't have, these Gibson ones are not made anymore. Tone Pros make them. And here you go, and we've gone with the Tone Pros. Can I get the system too, which has got the locking Allen wrench there, so you can actually lock this on your bridge. And that's the one we went with. And this was, I believe, around about £55 delivered. And that is the one we are going with, the Tone Pros. Because it, so it can go straight on to the bridge post. We don't need to alter anything. We're not even going to swap these old ones out. We're going to leave the old ones in. Uh, like so. And we're just going to put it straight on there. So I'm going to open it now. Drive a solid off somewhere, but I can't bother to dig it out. So we're just going to... Go with the tempos, and it should be an exact. Uh, uh, basically, I've got to go Stanley blade. Got no choice. I say Stanley blade. I don't do Stanley blades. I've got a uh, an exacto knife here. We're just going to get in under that. So we've gone with the tone pros. Money is never an object or a problem when it comes to doing something like this. It's a, it's a guitar worth thousands and thousands of pounds. It's actually worth a lot more now I've fixed it than it was when it came in, if you know what I mean. I'd put it in the, uh, I don't know, but you want to be sure I'm missing five grand. But there you go, there it is, that's the Tone Pros. And it's exactly the same spec, size, what have you, as the one at the top, which is the Gibson one. There is no difference at all. Tone Pros ABR, ABR2. And that's what we're going with, and we're going to drop it straight on the post. And it should be a direct drop in. Uh, oh, I know why it's not dropping in because the Allen, Allen screw. But you have two little adjusters here one there, one there for the Allen wrench to lock this into place so it doesn't drop off when you take your strings off. Now, I need the little Allen key. Because it won't be a metric one, you guarantee it'll be an imperial size. And all we're going to do is do these little screws here. I do believe we always put the screws, for whatever reason, to this side. I don't know why we do that. I don't know about you can adjust them better. But there you go. And the great thing about this is you turn them. Does it does it make a difference which way it goes? I like the screws that side because you can adjust them easier. That's just my preference. But with these, you can just tighten them in. And that way, the thing doesn't drop out. Now, I'm not going to tighten them in all the way because uh, I want to be able to still adjust. But there you go. But the great thing about that is it holds it in place. And there you go. And you won't get better than that. So that is it. Now, there are no notches on this one. I'm going to cut the notches in this one uh, myself which is a little bit more work, we'll be charging for it. But there you go, that is the bridge in place. I'm gonna see which is the correct way to orient them. I'm happy either way. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna do a little bit of research, see which way we do like to install them, and I'll install them that way. And that looks, just looks the part, doesn't it? It's period correct, it's, it's right for what should be on the guitar. That, I may put that, I'm not sending it back. I'm keeping it, I'll keep it in my parts box. I might stick that on my Hamer. I have a Hamer Studio, which is a fabulous guitar, but that would be considered, in my mind, that would be considered an upgrade because it gives you much more adjustment uh, on the intonation. Uh, so, we'll see. But anyway, that's that. Another thing I'm gonna do with this is, the nut is not quite central, it is, about 0.2 of a millimetre too far this way. I know that's not a lot, and I get away with it, and that's fine, but I'm not happy with it. It's protruding here, but it's inside there. I'm going to steam that off, or I'm going to try to steam that off. If I can get some steam penetrated in here to penetrate the glue, 
and get it shifted, I'm going to do that. But I don't want to be messing about and altering the paintwork uh, anyway. Just having a look here, it looks like there's been repair down here somewhere. Definitely a bleb on the paint, that doesn't matter. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to move that across a fifth of a millimetre. Uh, some of you may say, oh, that's a bit pernickety, that bit picky. You'll get away with that. I'm not a get away kind of person. It's, I just didn't level, I didn't, I didn't get it set right when I put it in there. And I should have got it right, and I didn't feel it was moved across one side more than the other. Um, which is a shame. But if I can get some steam in there, get it moved, brilliant. If I can't get any steam in there, I will leave it, but I would prefer to move it. What I'm going to do, how I'm going to do this is I'm going to get a, uh, I'm going to get some wet rag, damp rag, and I'm going to get a soldering iron, and I'm just going to steam each side, and just try and get it moved. I may show you that, I may not. I probably will come and show you if I manage to do it. There you go. So, but once that's done, we can get the knot cut, and we can start getting this guitar, get it ready to go out. Okay, so steaming the nut out went so smoothly. It steamed straight out, um, not a problem, took it out, moved it across, super glued it back in, absolutely perfect. So that was not a problem at all. So we are now ready to move on to the next stage, which is where we're going to mark out the nut for the strings. We're going to cut the nut, uh, get the strings on, and we're going to get this guitar finished. Um, looking at that nut again, by the way, what do you think to the colour of that nut? Too dark? I stained it using a mixture of tea, um, soy sauce and um, Worcestershire sauce. I uh, just let it soak overnight and uh, I think it came out really, really nicely. Anyway, I like it and if the owner likes it, which he does, that's all that matters. So, string spacing, the nut. There's a wonderful tool here. This is not the Stumac one, but I do have a Stumac one. It's a string spacing rule and the notches get closer together and what you do is you decide how wide you want your string space in from E to E or base E to treble E I've gone for 36 millimeters here so I measure 36 millimeters which is between these two black lines and it's six spacings and all you do is you line these two marks up with the outside and the inside then you mark every space so you get slightly closer together here and it gives you gives every cent string center the right width apart so wherever you do it wherever you set it that's the one I use the most there's two black marks here that's why they're marked off and I'm just going to check that everything is exactly where I want it which it is and all I'm going to do is I'm going to take I don't use these for slotting nuts anymore this is my old Hosco set and I'll take the smallest which is a 10 which is out of a 1046 set, which is there. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to very gently mark or cut a notch where I've marked it. I'm going to do it from this side because you'll see what I'm doing then. So where I've got that pen mark there, or that pencil mark there, I'm just going to put a notch in there. And that's where I'm going to carve. And I'm going to do the same for the other six. And this is where my strings are going to sit. You might wonder why don't I use this nut file anymore. It's because on the 10 and the 13 they tend to cut a V more than they cut a U shape or a semicircle. Uh, that's why I went out and I bought where are they? A different set, a much better set. They're probably down here. Uh, maybe I've just moved stuff around a little bit. I do have another set of Hosco files which are properly set for cutting, there we go, they're here. Now these are a lot more expensive, this is an 11 set, I think they cost me about 125, 130 pounds, but these cut the perfect U shape for each slot. So, so, so I know where to start to cut for each string, now that spacing is bang on for all of the strings, so I can now cut the right one. So say for instance, well, a 1046 set, there's a 10, 13, 17, 26, 36, 46. 
So that is the set of files I'm going to use. But these will cut the perfect shape now because I've already started that off. I know where to place my file. Straight on that slot now. I need to cut that a little bit thicker to make sure I get a sense of... Uh, what I'm doing with this is cutting the centre line. And once I know where I need to be with this file, then I can use the correct file. And there you go. And I'm not going to go mental and I'm going to angle it slightly back toward the headstock. And that is my first slot cut. And that will take the 46 string or the 0 0.046 of an inch. Or 46 thousandths of an inch. And that's the first slot cut. My first string will fit in there. I'm going to do exactly the same for the next six different sizes. I'm not going to cut too low. I'm just going to get the notch cut in. We'll test the length of everything once we've got strings on. I've also got to cut notches in the saddles at the end of the guitar, which you can't see at the moment because the saddles are not being cut on the new Tone Pro bridge I bought. So that's where I'm at. It's what I'm going to be doing. I will bring you back in very shortly. Moving on. Bridge is installed. This is your more modern uh, Tone Pro's ABR1 bridge. It's the version 2. Um, lovely nice fat saddles on there they're all lined up everything's lined up on there could have spaced them a little bit better slightly wider gap between the B and E than I would have liked um, but we are all fine on there everything's looking pretty good could possibly file that down a bit but I'm going to leave it as it is um, so we're now moving on to the nut so I've had not straight edge on there I've got strings to tension and I've straightened the neck and what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the gap between the first fret and the bottom of the string because we need to get to a certain height to bring it as low as possible where we can bar a chord but we're not pressing sharp by pressing down too much or too far. So as a rule on the bass side I like to go at 0.3 mil. that's pretty close to there and on the treble side I like to go 0.2 mil. we're massively high on this side we're more or less pretty much there on this side. Um, I have my normal heights at the 12th fret. We've got about 1.75 millimeters on the bass, 1.5 millimeters on the treble side. Still got a tuner plugged in because I've just brought the strings up to tension. We'll have a look at those heights again. So we're just over 1.75 on the treble, just over 1.5 on the bass. That's perfect. And we're going to be looking at just carving into these slots and making sure this spacing on these is alright. I need to come a little bit this way with the A string, but only a tiny bit, but that's fine. So the first one, I've already measured this, it is getting very close to 0.3mm. It's just a matter of once I've got the bridge and saddles all set where they need to be with the correct height above the 12th fret, the last part of the process is cutting the knot. We're still a little tiny bit high there. So we can just go in and just bring off a little more height and slightly angling back toward the tuner and straight again and that's it that's as much as I need on that one so the string will fit in perfectly because it is the right size file for the string 0 0.046 of an inch the tuning. Very good. Check the height. Just buzzing, which is perfect. Again, check the tuning and check the 12 fret. Intonation is fine as well. That was perfect. So we move on to the next one. We need to go gradually lower as we get to the thinner strings because these are being wound and thicker. are going to vibrate more. So this one we're looking for about 0.275. What I am going to do when I grab my cloth is wipe the files down. Ready for the next time I use them because that one's done. I'm not going to reshape the knot after I've cut the slots. I'm going to leave it shaped as it is. Then again, I might have to because it looks quite high on that side. But let's see where we are. So we're going to move to the next one, which is a 0 0.036. 
again just show you 0 0.036 beautiful taking the 0.3 feeler gauge way high on this side and I do see that I'm slightly more over to this side than I need to be so I'm going to cut at an angle and bring it in this way because what I did I'm going to reshape the top of the knot when all said and done I will have to restain the top the reason I'm going to do it at an angle is we're too far over close to this string I want to be closer to this string so I'm going to take the file and I need to go a long way down so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually cut in and down at an angle once I've followed the top this will be in the right place And that now is closer to the E string, it looks a lot better. Feel a gauge again, see where we are. We're still very high, so we can go a lot, lot more into that one. Just buzz in. So let's try for 0.25. We can still go a little deeper. Moving on to the next one, 26, again very high. So you see where this is going. File is cleaned. Moving on to the next one, the 26, we don't have a 26, it's a 28. Very ever so slightly wider, that's not really much of a problem. Slightly at an angle facing towards the tuna on the machine head, whatever you want to call it. Again, about 0.25 on this one. You don't have to measure, you can look and see by eye. So the three bass strings are done nice and low above the fret, first fret. 
very, very good. It's a beautiful action. I've got these three to do. I'm going to do these three off camera. Again, 0 0.25, 0 0.22, 0 0.2. We're going on these. I may reshape the nut afterwards. We'll see where we are. It probably will be a good idea. So I may have sacrificed a set of strings. That is no big deal. Um, like I said, I'm going to get these done off camera. Once they're done, we'll come back. We'll get the nut reshaped and we'll get the guitar set up and ready to go out of the door. That didn't take me too long. Uh, all of the strings are as low as I need them to be in the nut. As you can see, some of them are really quite low down. I'm going to need to, um, I'm going to recall the top of the nut with the strings off. So I'm going to remove the strings. But before I do that, because we are tuned to pitch, we are going to check the intonation and we're going to set the intonation right now uh, with the new bridge. I'm not going to zoom in anywhere. You can see where you are. Just clean these files up and get them out of the way. Don't need that anymore. Don't need that yet. Don't need that yet. Fret rocker we are done with. So that's great. So we're going to check the tune in and check the 12th fret. I know you're supposed to do this in playing position. It'll be fine in playing position. I will set the tune in in playing position later. A little bit flat on the A. No, it's a little flat. Right, we are a little bit flat with 12th fret. It means we need to bring the saddle toward the neck ever so slightly. Wherever it is, if we're flat on the 12 fretted note, we need to move the saddle to the left, looking at it this way. Flat and left are four letters. If we're sharp at the 12 fret, we need to move the saddle to the right. We're right and sharp are five letters, so easy, easy way to remember. So I'm just going to slacken off one full turn. Go the wrong way. I don't need to slacken off. I need to tighten. So one full turn that way, and one full turn again. And that is bringing the saddle this way, or to the left. I'll slot these carbon again because there's a little discrepancy in there, it's why it clicked. That's good. A D string. Full turn, just bring the saddle closer to the neck or left from the 12th fret.
fast guitar tuned in the intonation all set and we're as much as we can go on these adjusters here on the E and the B which is a little bit worrying but it always tends to be the case with Gibson which is a little shame so the guitar for all intents and purposes is set up So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to put a bit of relief in my neck but a little bit later I'm going to remove the strings and I'm going to re-carve this nut or the top of the nut because we are quite, these strings are quite deep in the nut now and I need to reshape it which means also I'm probably going to have to reshape it or not reshape it, restain it again later um, but you know part from the course when you're in a big project like this end of the day when someone's spending four and a half hundred pounds uh, to get their guitar right, you are going to do the very best you can do. So, strings are going to come off, going to re carve the top of a knot, re stain it, and uh, re polish it. That string still looks a little bit high in there. I could possibly go a little bit deeper with that. Anyway, leave it with me. Once it's all done, we'll get the guitar back together, we'll stretch the strings in, we'll put a bit of relief in the neck, and we'll do the final setup. Recarving or reshaping the nut, and there you go. And I've been across with quite a brutal file. This is a, actually a fret leveling file I removed from. Well, it's actually a beveling file I removed from my beveling um, block. And this removes a lot of material in a short space of time. And I've used it to reshape the nut. And I've got the nut more or less as I want it now. But the problem with it now is. The top has now become translucent and it's the same shade again as it was before I stained it. So I'm going to have to restain the nut. Now before I do do that, I've got to carry on shaping it. So I'm going to move to a much better file. This again being my famous or infamous Swiss made uh, file by Valor. But great piece of kit. It's a number four cut, super smooth but super short. I love this file. It's the most used file in my workshop, I think. And uh, I always look to put the safe side down so I can't dig into anything. Now, I have covered the areas I don't want to dig into with tape, and I will go with another layer, just in case I do slip with the file. I won't, but famous last words, eh? These strings will not be staying on. I'm keeping them on there just for tuning purposes. I, I realised once I've got them on, I also went back in the case, the uh, client had already sent some guitar strings anyway. So these are the wrong gauges. These are 1046. He's got a hybrid set 9.5 or 9.5 to 46. But anyway, back to shaping the knot. And I'm going to be just following the contour and just rolling it over like so. Just to give it a little bit of roundness to the back edge there. And then I'll feel with my fingers. And that really feels quite nice. The hardest thing about this now is going to be to restain it while it's on the guitar because I can't soak it in any fluid overnight like I did before. So I'm going to mix up a concoction of tea, Worcester sauce, soy sauce. I'm going to soak it into some, I've got some kind of felt, about, felt about this thick from a uh, ironing board cover, inside an ironing board cover. I'm going to soak that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bandage over the top of this knot overnight. I'm going to seal all this area off, pull it over there, tape it over, ear tight. And it should soak enough of the colourant in to stain that knot and to make it look the part again. Uh, I can't think of anything else I could possibly do. Now that feels really, really nice. I'm loving. And who doesn't love a hand carved knot? Seriously, come on guys. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of kit. I just need to round this over just a little bit more, so nice and gentle. 
and this is why he's paying you money. I've charged the guy for this, the whole job. It's costing £463. Now you've got £53 for a brand new bridge, uh, a Tempros bridge. Uh, it's £65 for a brand new hand carved and fitted nut. Now we don't only just fit a nut, we have to dig an old one out, reshape, re-carve and refit this nut. It takes him a couple of hours gone in here, so 65 quid is not expensive. He's had a refret at 200 quid, uh, sorting out the nibs was 25 quid. Uh, we've also had to straight, I've charged him £100 for straightening the neck. By rights I should be charging a minimum of £250 for straightening the neck. It's an old vintage instrument, if this had gone wrong, it was, you know, it, it was my fault. Now, a lot of work goes into straightening the neck. Uh, this was considerably bent. Once it was straightened, it also needed re-radiusing. So the fact that I've only charged him £125 for that is uh, really, really good. Anyway, we're all said and done, everything's priced. Uh, the fret wire was £13. It's come to the grand total of £463 all done, considering it's a, now, a guitar now worth £5,000. It was worth 5000 anyway. It's in 1972. It's more or less irreplaceable. P90 pickups on this. Great piece of kit. But now even better because it's playable and it looks fantastic. I'd have thought if you were going to sell this. I'd definitely think of insuring this for over £5,000. I know it's insured for 5000 now. I've been looking at insuring this for about £7,000 myself. Don't quote me on that. But next part of the job is try and get this not restained that is going to be no bean feet in itself um i'll give it a go and see how it comes out so i'm going to show you what i'm going to do with this and how i'm going to stain i'm going to try and stain this knot. what i'm going to do is i'm going to just seal this area i don't want too much wet getting into and under the knot or into that wood and swelling the wood up and weakening it anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to protect these areas and what I need to do is just get under the knot here. I mean I'm not going to saturate anything anyway. This is just as a little bit of uh, insurance. I'm going to seal off these, this area just a little. The edges don't really need to be stained. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to grab something like, and I'm going to show you what I do. If I'm ever working on a, a, an unpainted guitar, say you've got a ding in it, say you've got something like a satin finished guitar, might have a little ding, you might ding it and I think, oh, how am I going to get it out? There's an easy way to get it out. And uh, what I tend to do is I get a piece of this thick felt and I soak it in water and I put it on as a bandage, just damp, and then I tape over it. And the dampness from this felt would soak into the wood and the wood would just pop back out. You don't need any heat, any steam or anything. You take a bandage off after a few hours and you find that your wood has gone back to its original position. All you've got to do is wait for it to dry out. And I'm going to use a similar sort of method to stain this knot. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to soak this in some dark... I've got a bigger piece of this, better than what I've got here, because I'm going to use one whole piece. Let's see if I just got one knocking about. I should have prepped this before I started filming, but... Me all over that. Here you go, I've got some here. Nice piece there. I'm going to cut a piece to the right size. If the scissors work, that is. Okay, we're going to go about there. And I'm going to steep this in some something brown, something darker on the Oh my god, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I do have some wood stain. I'm being stupid. I don't have to do anything. What colour have we got here? Such a tar, I forgot all about it. I've got some wood dye. A couple of coats of this will work a treat. Need to give us a good shake. Totally disregard what I said about staining this a minute ago. This 
should be ideal. Let's give it a go. We've got nothing to lose by trying this. I'm going to grab me some kitchen roll, put on a latex glove, I'm going to zoom out for one so you can see a little bit more what I'm doing. Don't need to be that zoomed in. I always stock a box of, uh, well not latex, but it's latex free. Just like that. Just like that. These things. Here's what sits. Who oh, nurse. Yes. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to stain it. Wood. I forgot all about this wood stain. Now I would ideally like something to soak into this knot. But let's give this a go and see where we are. A few coats of this should be brilliant if we can get it to hold. Some loads on there. Whether or not it'll take. I don't think it's going to take. Okay, that really is not that bad, is it? Let's see how that goes. You know what, I think that'll work. My idea was to steep this in something and tape over it. I still might do that. I might even do it with this. Is it a good idea? There's only ever one way to find out if it's a good idea or not, and that's to try it. I must have just wang that on there like so. And give it a go. And that is the way to do it. You just tape it over it and leave it. A short time now we do have some escaping onto the guitar I don't want that gonna leave that for an hour and see where we are so friends we are all done with this uh, amazing instrument 1972 Gibson Les Paul Deluxe with the um, P90 pickups just a great piece of kit so let's try and remember what we've done with this guitar when it came in the neck was bent um, it had relief in it that you couldn't get rid of it I wanted the neck straight so spent a considerable amount of time straightening the neck which I did we then removed the uh, zero frets, um, removed the nibs, refretted it. Uh, we cut a new, cut and aged a piece of bone uh, and put in a new nut or for the new nut. Replaced the bridge with a Tone Pros System 2 ABR1 bridge. Uh, we put the old one back in there, which was it wasn't bent. It's just worn over the years. That groove in it, that that bit of. Uh, Bed in there was just wear from from a hand because the saddles were uh, they were, were right. So put the bridge back in there. They're the new um, posts. We don't, didn't need to use the new ones, even though they're the same size. So I put the new bridge on there, and we've cleaned it up and set it up. One thing we did have under the original nut, by the way, we did have a shim under there. I removed the shim completely and sat the nut straight on the guitar on the shelf there. A beautiful, beautiful piece of kit. Now a lovely nut that is. I've aged it as well. Um, so yeah, all done. And what a fabulous piece of kit. This is the oldest Les Paul or the oldest Gibson I've had in the workshop by one year. I did have a 1973, which I same sort of thing. I straightened the neck. That was a lot worse neck. It had twisted and warped and bent. And uh, pretty much the same job, refretting the whole lot. But yeah, great piece of kit. But like I say, it is all finished. And it looks fantastic. I have slightly aged the saddles uh, by filing just across the top to bring them 
so we look a little bit tarnished and a little bit uh, brushed. You're not going to see it here, but yeah, what a great piece of kit. Just look at that. 1972 Gibson Les Paul Deluxe with P90s. What a fabulous piece of kit, but it is done. Um, the owner is ready to come and pick it up. They're going to pick it up this week. And um, fantastic. So one thing remains for me to do. I have to remind you of my website, facebook.com forward slash ng17. That's facebook.com forward slash n-g-o-n-e-s-e-v-e-n. There's also fretfriend.co.uk. <coughs> Excuse me. I am Victor. I am your fret friend. And until the next wonderful project, as always, God bless you. Be good to each other. I'll see you in the next one.